minutes will now be recorded. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to the meeting of the Harwich Conservation Commission for August 5th, 2020. The meeting is being held by remote participation. And I'd like to read a notice from the governor's office pertaining to these type of remote meetings. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law chapter 30A section 18 and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Town of Harwich Conservation Commission on August 5th, 2020 at 6.30 p.m. will be conducted by a remote participation. Specific information and general guidelines for remote participation by members of the public and or parties with a right and or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the Town of Harwich website at www.harwich-ma.gov. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so via recording on demand on the Harwich 18, Channel 18 website or on our Town of Harwich YouTube page. Okay, well, let's get started. I hope everybody's doing well. And the first item on the agenda is a request for determination of applicability for Howard Conservation Trust, Zero Church Street, Map 75, Parcel J3-6, Vegetation Management and a Creation of a Trail Spur. Do we have a representative here from the HCT? Hi, Brad. This is Tyler Maycath. How are you? Good, Tyler. How are you? Good. Thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, putting me first on the agenda. That's very nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, Tyler, do you want to describe what you uh, intend to do for us briefly? Absolutely. Yeah, no problem. Um, hopefully everyone has the uh, map um in front of them um so at the muddy creek headwaters preserve um there is a loop trail in place uh, we would propose to establish a spur trail uh, um, onto the peninsula um an additional tenth of a mile or so um and uh establish a bench out of the peninsula and we also propose to do some, uh, some vegetation management, which will serve a, sort of a dual purpose of invasive plant management and this pruning. Um, a lot of the shoreline, um, as you know, has been disturbed due to changes in the water level of Muddy Creek and the salinity over time. As a result, um, Many of the areas along the banks are full of invasive plants like Asiatic bittersweet, multiflora rose, um, various bush honeysuckles, and Phragmites. Um, so we're just proposing to do uh, me mechanical management by hand or with power tools. At this point, we're not proposing to do any chemical management of these plants. Um, and we wouldn't be removing any, um, any native trees. Uh, we would like to maybe prune some of the trees up a little bit for viewing purposes. Um, and as far as the, uh, removed brush, uh, we'll probably create brush piles on the property, um, for habitat purposes. It's not really practical for us to, uh, get the material out of there because it's so far out hopefully that answers um any questions you might have about our project um I'm certainly available to answer any questions you have okay thank you tyler do you have any comments for us amy on this sure just that um the vista management would have to abide by our regulations for vista pruning which is trees um, within the view corridor um, basically out by the bench um, they could be potentially pruned up the lower limbs, but they cannot be topped. And any um, shrubby vegetation could be pruned down to a height of no less than four feet. Um, 
and I'd be happy to meet out there with Tyler and, um, and go over all of that as well. I would suggest that any invasives that you're proposing to remove, um, that instead of just piling anything on site that you potentially burn them, that will reduce the risk of um, the cut invasives contributing to the spread. Um, they can do that by roots, rhizomes, berries, things like that. So I would, um, I'd recommend somehow disposing it instead of um, just leaving it. So, but I do recommend, uh, and it's a three foot wide path. Um, and again, Tyler had said everything was gonna be either hand um, maintained or with hand type power tools. Um, and I would recommend approval with a negative three determination prior that, um, provided that you just consult with me about the exact location of the bench and we talk a little bit about the pruning. Thanks, Amy. All right, I'll, I'll ask the commissioners if they have any questions or comments. Uh, I'll start with Stan. Um, no problem. I know the conservation trusts are great land stewards, and I know I've walked that new trail in my first comment to Mike that I read, saw, saw that day, and I said, where's the overbook? <laughs> Because <laughs> right now the trail is all through the woods and, and you don't get any appreciation of the, the creek there. So I think this is a great opportunity. All right, thanks, John. Any comments? No comments. I support this uh, with Amy's qualifications. Okay, Carolyn? I agree. I'm Good. Uh, let's see, uh, Ernie. Yep. No, I, I have no comments. I only would mention to Tyler. I I think you can go four feet on the trail if you wanted to. Um, we wouldn't have any issues with that. Um, give you more room for people walking in opposite directions and that sort of thing in, in our pandemic environment. But um, other than that, I'm fine. Um, Tyler, what time of year do you want to do the work? Uh, we're actually hoping to start this month. So, oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I had actually already planned out work days with the hope that you would allow us to move forward with this proposal. Yeah. Just for my own education. Um, when do, does Phragmites drop seeds? Is that soon? Is that September? It is soon. Um, well, later on in August and, yeah. um, so the ideal time to take care of it is August. Right, right now. Okay, good. Okay, would one of the commissioners like to make a motion on this proposal? I'll make a motion to approve the Harwich Conservation Trust request for the creation of a trail spur with a negative three determination. And we request that you uh, discuss with Amy the exact location of the bench. Okay, could I have a second, please? I'll oh, second. Okay. okay, we've got a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries unanimously. All right, thank you, and, and good luck, Tyler. Thank you, Brad, and all the commissioners, and Amy as well. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all in person, perhaps in the near future. Take care. Yes, thanks. I, we, we hope the same. Yes, indeed. Thanks okay. very much. Yep, thank you. All right, next to the agenda, we have a request for determination of applicability for, for 20 Bayberry Road, map 24, parcel K1-5. It's a proposal for a demo and rebuild of a dwelling in a flood zone. And uh, if the proponents want to give us a brief description of the, the project, that'd be great. Dan, I think you're muted right now. Let's try that again. Good evening, Dan Crono from Moran Engineering. Um, Tom and Ann Chipman, I can see are on as well, the owners. Um, let's see, Tom and Ann Chipman, they have, they have this house that's in the uh, Bayberry subdivision, surrounded by, um, surrounded by houses and the 
uh, unpaved road, the unpaved Bayberry Road. There, um, they bought this house, I believe, a year, a year, year and a half ago. The original proposal was to. Um, rehab the house and add a second floor but when they got into it the foundation was unsuitable because it's it um the footing is right at surface in some areas and it certainly doesn't meet the four foot building code requirement so they went back to the um back to the drawing board so you're looking at their latest proposal um we were at ZBA last week and they did approve the project. Um, so the the southwest corner of the property is in the 100 year floodplain. So on the very uh, outer edge of the floodplain that would come in from uh, Sacquatucket Harbor, um, then Andrews River, which would be um, probably about 600 feet away to the west so it come up that way and this is the elevation 11 would be the 100 year flood in their property the lowest points um would be nine nine look at the plan here and uh, but most of the property is above that elevation 11. so the, the idea would be to to the idea would be to have the foundation and the slab above the elevation 11 so there would be no crawl space or basement um and then we would like to uh they would like to be able to raise the grade around the house so that there's no floodplain next to the house so that would require bringing in about six inches of soil in that southwest corner about 15 yards of soil um, the actual area that's within the uh 100 year floodplain uh, would existing is about 208 square feet of footprint it would go down to 170 so there would be a reduction within the um, within the uh, 100 foot jurisdiction area or 100 year flood plan I should say so with that I guess I will just uh, I will ask uh, for questions for myself and the owners here if there are any questions all right thanks dan amy do you have any comments on this one for us um not too many i'm recommending approval with a negative two determination they're um only about six inches you know they only need to raise the grade about six inches on the southwest corner to um get that corner of the house above flood elevation and as dan said um, for actual work in the floodplain the footprint is going to be smaller for work in the floodplain even though the house itself is going to be getting bigger um it's a very just a naturally vegetated lot with pretty much cape cod lawn and a couple of random shrubs i would recommend it stay that way in terms of um that there's not going to be any sod or turf lawn as per our regulations and um the regulation so there would be a, a natural cape cod mix seed used if anything and our normal conditions about no chemical applications um technically we still have jurisdiction within the 100 foot buffer to a floodplain um we'll be clarifying that but i would recommend that no um fertilizers pesticides herbicides be um be applied um and that's about it all right thank you amy all right let me start with the commissioners with comments and questions stan do you have any comments on this one brad we call it okay john no okay. comments okay all okay. right okay. carolyn it looks like they're going pretty fast, so I don't know if that's going to happen. No, I have no comments either, Brad. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, it strikes me as very straightforward. Um, I think Amy's comments covered it. So I think um, if anybody would like to make a motion, I think we can move ahead now. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the... Uh, RDA for 20 Bayberry Road for demo and rebuild of a dwelling with a, was it a negative two, Amy, determination and with a condition of uh, no chemical application on the lawn. Okay. Thank 
Okay, could I have a second, please? I'll okay. second. All right, seconded by Carolyn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. You too, thanks. Okay, so next we have a few notice of intents. The first one is 49 Snow and Road, Map 15 Parcel N2, proposal to raise and replace the dwelling. Do we have a representative here for the project? Oh, John, okay, here's muted. Uh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, great. Sorry about that. So again, Sean Riley, Coastal Engineering, representing the applicant. Um, I'd like to apologize for submitting the revised landscape plan on the day of the hearing. I know you haven't had a chance to look at it, um, but we felt that it was important enough to, to submit what we felt uh, were key observations provided by Amy uh, in her cursory review of the plan. Uh, it mainly addresses the species of, uh, of plantings and um, a specification for the lawn. Uh, we had originally called out sod lawn um, and we've modified that and we can go over the details of that uh, as we go on. Uh, this property is located on the western shoreline of Witchmere Harbor. A concrete seawall separates the upland portion of this property uh, from marsh and land under ocean. There are two flood zones uh, that comprise land subject to coastal storm flowage on this property. There's a velocity zone uh, that cuts through uh, a portion of the existing dwelling, elevation 14, and an AE zone landward of that, uh, elevation 11. This property uh, terraces down from Snow Inn Road and then down again into the water. The embankment that runs uh, along the uh, eastern side of the road uh, is a coastal bank. The top of coastal bank is delineated in green on the plans in front of you. Uh, and that is a vertical buffer uh, and is not a sediment source. This property is developed with a single family dwelling, elevated deck, exterior access stairs, concrete walkways, lawn and parking areas along Snow Inn Road. Uh, when we first started looking at this project, it was a renovation to the existing house uh, that was built in the 80s. It needs some serious upgrades and quickly um, we exceeded the 50% threshold, which triggers full compliance with the uh, building code regulations uh, for construction within flood zones. The, as I said before, the existing structure lies within the velocity zone. So we looked at elevating uh, potential of the structure in its current location uh, that would require temporary jacking of the structure, possibly relocating it to, uh, to demolish the existing foundation and portions of the existing bulkhead. Uh, quickly, uh, it became obvious that uh, there were a lot of, um, a lot of issues with disruption construction access constraints and costs to try to salvage the, um, the, the existing house. Uh, and with the, given the amount of renovations that we were looking to do to the house, uh, we evaluated this and uh, came up with uh, the decision that the best option was to reconstruct the house uh, in a location that was outside uh, of, the, of the velocity zone and in the A zone. The proposed design before you provides a FEMA compliant structure uh, that's actually elevated uh, several feet above uh, the requirements for the A zone. Uh, there's an open pier um, foundation underneath uh, as we are in close proximity to the velocity zone, uh, but with it set back from the, uh, the seawall, uh, we felt that uh, it's, it has the requirements uh, necessary to meet compliance with the building code and also with the additional elevation uh, with anything that would come over that wall. Um, we have a net reduction of building uh, decks and stairs and impervious cover, uh, coverage. However, we do have an increase uh, in the coverage with the uh, P-Stone walkways in combination with uh, the only available off-street parking on the street side of the house. We have provided the removal of lawn and the installation of native plants to mitigate the increase. And uh, we'd like you to just keep in mind that this is a very uh, small lot 
um, with very little usable space to start with and uh, very little options of where where we could site the house and um, where we could fit things. Joe Waller from Stimson Landscape Architects should be on the on the line as well to answer any of the hardscape landscapes questions. Um, and I'll be able to uh, answer any of the other questions. So with that, I'd like to open it up with, uh, to the commission. All right, thank you, Sean. Uh, Amy, do you wanna give us a summary, please? Sure. This property is directly on Winchmere Harbor. I don't think you can get much closer to being in Winchmere Harbor. <laughs> And um, it's a really unique property. It's got more of a boathouse underneath and living quarters upstairs. And that is what they're proposing, I believe, to, um, they're still calling it a boathouse. And um, as Mr. Riley said, the, there's actually less building in the zero to 50 foot buffer and really the whole property is in the 50 foot buffer. Um, but there is an increase in some of the pervious aspects, which would be the P stone and end of the driveway. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, or the landscape architect, but um, you are proposing a two to one mitigation. Um, typically in the zero to 50, we require a three, but I, um, in speaking with Sean, so there might be some other merits of this project that would count as mitigation, such as getting the living structure outside the velocity zone, um, installing a lot more native plants, um, really everything on here um, is native and, and, and things like that. Um, considering that the increase is really in native pea stone and, and it, um, impervious material and with pervious material, sorry. Um, what are you proposing to do with the roof runoff? Uh, the roof runoff, the, sorry. Um, if we hadn't shown them or hadn't noted it, they will go into um, subsurface dry wells or drip, or drip strips, and that could be conditioned as such. Yep. Um, so the current wall that's there, if you go out to the site, there's a clear um, wall that's a few feet above mean high and before it transitions into the boathouse or actual structure you're keeping. That is what you're keeping. You're going to peel the rest off and rebuild the house behind it, correct? So that's there's no correct. Yeah. So there's a, sorry, go ahead. There's no changes proposed to that footing wall, if, if you will. Um, sorry, my neighbors are using their motorcycles. Um, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> is there any need, have you checked to see the stability of that wall? Is there any need to reinforce that? There, there, so the only thing that we'd be doing to modify that wall, if you get a chance to go out to the site, the, uh, the boathouse portion of the, the lower level has two doors that swing out and there was actually a rail system that went out to the water um, that was incorporated and they were built down into probably a foot or so down into that uh, to that wall. So we wouldn't be looking to modify anything of the footprint of that wall, but simply infill uh, the piece where those doors are uh, on that side for it's probably 10 feet wide by maybe a foot, foot and a half tall uh, that's notched out of the existing bulkhead wall but we did do a structural analysis of the remaining portion of the wall and, uh, and found it stable. So uh, essentially just peeling everything off of it. There's a slab uh, on grade that sits on top of it. There's, it's two pieces. It really is the building sitting right on top of the wall. So we would anticipate just pulling it off and leaving what's there. And if there were any modifications after we pulled it off, we would come back to the commission for, for modifications. Yeah. Um, and I apologize if you already stated this. Um, what is going to be the foundation for the new building? It is going to still be in the AE flood zone, so it has to be compliant with that. It will. So the um, the design is going to have a helical system. So we'll be uh, installing helical piers, and then we'll have a, a grade beam uh, style very similar to a velocity zone foundation. Uh, where you've got a grade beam and a helical system so that in the event that uh, there was overwash and scour 
behind that bulkhead wall, uh, the structure would be able to freestand uh, on its own system. Um, can we get a copy of that foundation plan for the file if we don't already have it? Absolutely. I think, I mean, even though we're concerned with footprint, obviously what goes in the ground is important too. Um, so if we could have that, that would be very helpful. Um, and then my comments really are just about the planting plan. Thank you for getting us to that or getting us that. Um, we did talk um, before I went on vacation about the changes. And I do see you made them. I have a couple of tweaks and suggestions for you. Um, I see you put Tupelo on there. Tupelo really like to be kind of in near protected freshwater wetlands. Not, um, they are on our native list, but they're just, again, it's just something that's probably not gonna do very well for you out there. It's gonna take an awful lot for that to happen. I have seen them. I've seen, seen them in one place in Harwich, right on the edge of a marsh, but that's it. Otherwise you see them mostly on pond edges that are less exposed. So again, I would I would consider, you know, more Eastern red cedar. Um, as it, that's really, that's really the tree that's going to do the best for you out there. Um, and then on your plan, you also say at the very bottom of your planting schedule, the Spartina patens. I can't see um, really what the topo is there, but that does need occasional inundation from salt water. So with the wall there, if you're not going to have inundation, that plant won't make it. Um, and I think those are small tweaks that you and I can kind of chat about with, with the commission, um, as long as the commission's okay with, you know, making sure that it's an appropriate native plant that's going in there. Um, they, but yeah, that's, those are small things. I did say, we did say, um, you know, we have no turf um, condition or regulation, but um, with the exception that we could allow um, a native um, turf. We have done that in the past, and I see that you're preparing, you're proposing a micro clover fescue blend, which would be considered um, a native, in my my opinion. Um, but other than that, I um, I think I'll leave it up. I think um, I don't have any more questions for right now. All right, thanks, Amy. All right, let's start with commissioner comments. Um, Stan, do you want to begin? Sure. Um, no, I, that was a good explanation because it was kind of confirming what we were thinking looking at the site this afternoon. So it kind of really confirmed what we thought it was going to be. Um, and I guess. Most, as Amy mentioned, I mean, we, we are adding about 373 square feet of more coverage, but it was mostly in that pervious walkways and driveways. So what was the material going to be there? It's going to be P-Stone. P-Stone, okay. P-Stone. Right, yep. Sorry, thank you. That's all yep. I have. Brother. All right, thanks, Dan. John, any comments? I just have uh, clarification questions, and I apologize if we've already answered this question, but I, I didn't quite catch it. Just looking at the site today, um, uh, what it looks like to me is there's a footing, which you may be referring to as the wall, that maybe extends three feet up from the uh, from the sand or gravel or whatever is the bottom there. We were there basically at high tide, so it was, the bottom of that footing was underwater. And then it looked like poured on top of that is a concrete wall, at least on the north side of the building. So do I understand correctly that your, your proposal is to take down that thing that I'm calling a concrete wall. It looks like poured concrete with some openings for windows in it. That is what's coming off and the footing underneath it, which looks to be fatter, wider than the wall, 
is going to remain in place and you're going to build inside of that perimeter that's defined by that wall or footing. Okay, so that, yeah, yes. So, so essentially, the I, I would I would assume that the first thing that came along was that um, was that bulkhead, uh, and that runs the entire length uh, along uh, the harbor there. So, what they did was build on top of that. So that what they built on top of that uh, and extended above ground at that point will come off uh, and and reveal the original uh, bulkhead. So the bulkhead will be continuous along the entire length at the same elevation all the way around the east face and then wrapping around the north side. So essentially just taking the structure itself right off of the bulkhead. Okay, thank you. I don't, I don't have anything more. All right, thank you. Uh, Carolyn. Um, I have a question. Is this a standalone property or is this part of the property that extends over to Bayview? This, this is owned by uh, the same owners of the property across the street, but it is, as far as the assessor's office, considered a separate saleable property. So this could be sold on its own uh, at any time to a, 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 a purchaser. Well, that was my Correct. question. If it was all one piece yep. of property, it would have been preferable in my mind to move the parking across the street. And that would right. have... Uh, changed your footprint considerably, but you, if it is a standalone property, then that wouldn't work um, as well. Yeah. So we. Yep. Just to just to add on to that, so we are we're actually in the front setback as far as zoning is concerned. So we can't go any closer to the street than we are right now. What we did was we shrunk the we shrunk the width of the building in order to get it to pull it pull it back from the bulkhead, but. That's as far back as we could we could move the house towards the street given the zoning setback. We couldn't increase that nonconformity. Okay. And then, sorry. Are, you are aware that we have no chemicals, no fertilizers, no pesticides, et cetera. Um, Absolutely. And, and no in ground irrigation. Um, Correct. Because Relative to the house, that's a pretty big lawn as I'm looking at it. <laughs> it's, everything's relative. It's a tiny house. It's only, what, 800 square feet? I live down um, the street. I walk by it all the time. And I've known the previous yeah. owner. <laughs> uh, Sean, I think something that we didn't, uh, that you didn't mention was that the septic is actually on the other property. Yes. Yeah. So, so actually, the septic. Yep. So the so the septic. Um, we can't put the septic system. On, the existing septic system right now is within the uh, 100 foot buffer uh, on the adjacent property. There's an easement for that um, to put it onto that other property. So the there's a lift station that pumps it up to that property. And part of this um, project, we're going to take the uh, existing system that's within the 100 foot buffer across the street and push it about 200 feet um, away from the resource areas. So we'll still have a lift station that will pump up, but it'll pump up much further uh, closer to uh, a Bayview Road on the other on the other property. So you, you could put parking across the street also if your septic's there you're not really standing it, alone so we if, if we were doing the uh, we would still be within the 50 foot buffer unfortunately because the the uh the coastal bank is right there so we would have to take down the existing wall that's across the street and um and we'd still be in the 50 foot buffer uh with that parking and both both parking areas would be immediately adjacent to the street and draining onto the street. So um, basically, it serves the same function. The, the house is is in between where they would be parking and the resource area. So the only difference would be that you'd be just on the other side of the street. So we wouldn't see that that would really make a huge benefit and would also require uh, relocating and cutting into the grade across the street to relocate that retaining wall. And so you figure you would have two cars in that spot that you've got designed for parking? Correct. If we could even get two cars. 
it might just be one big suburban. It's, it's really not that big of a space. It's only 20, I believe, 20 feet long. So, okay. okay. 22 so feet. Yeah, it's only designed for one. It's only designed for one space. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're comfortable with our uh, regulations, our, our, our requirements for the lawn, as opposed to a, a something that required less maintenance and easier to grow. Um, I have no questions. All right, thanks. Ernie, you're next. Um, yeah, so the existing railway system that's in there, that's coming out? That's correct. Okay. Um, and the existing pier and float, what's the intention with that? The, so the intention with that, it's, it's starting to fall into disrepair. Um, we are looking to re-permit that and re-license that. There's um, with the change of ownership, we're required to update the chapter 91 license on that. So we're in the process of, uh, of looking to uh, possibly reconstruct that. Uh, but at this point, there's, there's nothing proposed for that. Okay. If it's reconstructed, would, would you be coming back to see us again? Absolutely. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, on this new structure, is it going to be enclosed then, or is it going to be open? You're, you're calling this a boathouse. The lower, you're taking away the. Yeah, it's, it's really the, the lower the lower level will be, will be for uh, boat storage. So the the half that's closest to the water will be a open uh, pier uh, look, and then uh, back behind that, there's basically two. Um, uh, bay doors that would open that they would store their kayaks and any of their um, any of their boating equipment. Okay. All right. Um, so the so the actual the actual open space on the lot underneath the building will be greater than what's there now because most of it is enclosed. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. And the living space, all of the living space will be on the on the upper level. Yeah. So what are you planning to use for uh, surface area underneath the, on the lower level that's open? It will be pavers, just for durability and for, for pulling boats up and, and, um, and just for setting things down. So it will be, it will be a paver system and that's included within the, um, the calculations. Okay. And between the, the end of the pier and the pavers underneath the building, what's that? That would be lawn. Space? That'll be lawn. That would be lawn. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I see on the uh, south side of the building, is that also paver? It's like a, a paver patio there? On the south side of the building, no, there's a, uh, there's a deck. And then to the south of that is the um, the P-Stone walkway that leads over to the, the stairs that go up the slope. Okay. Oh, I see. So, I, yeah, all right. So there's two rows of plantings then, and then the P-Stone walkway, and the, the staircase transitions those two layers, the two rows of plantings, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, all right, then... The deck will be, I assume, wooden or something of that nature, mahogany or something. Correct. Mahogany or FA. It'll be something that's that's it weather is. resistant for the for the shoreline. All right. And that's been taken into the calculations as well. Yes, it has. Okay. Good. I have no other questions then. Okay. Um, I've got a couple, I guess, comments. So. I think that I'm generally not supportive of increases in the zero to 50 um, with exception of suitable mitigation. So I guess the, you know, the increase in the 375 ish uh, square feet and the, the not meeting the, the three to one mitigation, something I'm concerned about. So um, Amy made some comments similar to that. Do you think you can bring that up to three to one? Is that possible? Or can you bring down the uh, increased coverage in zero to 50? I, I think we can, we can bring down, if it's a sticking point, I think we can bring down the, the coverage to meet that three to one. Okay, so you'd rather keep um, 
the increase in the P-Stone, that, that's the bulk of it is from what I can see. You know, you built your structure similar, deck and stairs are similar. Right. And so it's, you know, in this case, I think you're hearing some agreement that um, there's some benefits here, but to have, you know, both the increase and the relaxation of the, of the three to one, I'm concerned about that. Um, what do you think? Yes, if, there, if there's a, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'll let Amy. I was just going to ask, I, I know you've thought about this, Amy, and um, you've discussed it a little bit. Do you, do you see some nice gains that could come from bringing that number up in any particular area? Um, you know, of course, always along, right along the top is, it's, it, let me back up. The site is difficult because it's already so altered, and essentially the resource area is completely disconnected from the upland because of the wall. So in terms of major gains by the addition of a few more native plantings, I don't see a huge gain in going from a two to one to a three to one in terms of what that would offer. I see the bigger gain in getting the septic, the leach field, you know, greater than a hundred feet away from the wetland um, to give more time for infiltration before it gets to our harbor, which is is already impacted. It really is up to the commission. Um, I think uh, mitigation is not, in my opinion, is not just you know square footage for square footage. I think there's the other things um, are advantageous as well. Getting a structure, even though it's a small amount, getting it out of the B zone having the septic be farther away. I think those do count um, in instances too. So I would, um, I just don't think adding a few more native plants is going to greatly tip the scale here. Um, but if you want to go by the letter of the regulation, I completely, I agree and respect that. Yep. No, I, I understand what you're saying. The septics is probably the biggest gain, but um, this comes up quite a bit and, and we've been fairly consistent if we are going to grant it a variance, you know, we often look to mitigate. And, and so in this case, it would be somewhat of a double variance by relaxing the three to one. So I, I guess my preference would be to, to not have the increase in zero to 50 and just have a flat, um, you know, keep your same square footage. So that's my preference, but I, I certainly don't prefer having the increase and relaxing the three to one, even if mm -hmm. the gains are not substantial. I don't know how other folks feel, but that's my feeling. And just so you know, Mr. Chair, there may be some people in the audience who might want to comment on this one. I did get a few people reach out for it. Oh, that's a good point. I'll, I think I'll... Hey, hey Brad. Yeah. Brad, um, yep. I just have one other comment. Sure. We were listening. Sean, just want to clarify about the boathouse. You mentioned originally there was a rail system. I don't know what kind of boats were under there, but it did say with the new building, that's more for just personal craft like kayaks, paddle boards, nothing motorized or anything that could, you're not putting any kind of rail system that would access that boathouse. No, we're not. Okay. Just for just for hand carried uh, uh, right. watercraft. Okay. Just wanted to clarify after I heard you talking about it. So thank you. Yep. I have a question, Brad. Sure. Um, the the septic system being across the street and basically uphill. Um, mm -hmm. You've got a pump system to do it. That's that's correct. It's right now there there is a pump system now. Uh, we're going to put a new pump system in that uh, has newer, newer technology, newer containment, um, and it's going to push it. Uh, it's of the same size, uh, and it's going to end up pushing it further up the hill uh, than it currently does. Actually, it's on the, the far end of the property. Okay, what happens if you lose electricity? If, if we lose electricity, there's, a, there's storage within the, um, within the unit itself for one day's flow, and that's the requirement. So there's, oh, there's there, the requirement as far as the state code is a day's flow. The bottom line is if if you're, uh, if the power goes out, you're not doing laundry, that's your, your big thing. Um, you're not really, you're not really doing a whole lot. 
Um, so we take that into consideration with all of our designs. Okay, so I don't see any indication here that you, you have uh, thought about a generator. Um, no, we have not. Okay, have and not. you have no intentions of and again, a generator. Yeah. It's not in this yeah, not at this. Yeah, not at this, not at this point. Okay, thank you. Okay, I guess this time I'll ask if there are any comments from members of the audience. Okay, seeing none, I guess let's uh, maybe regroup back to that question. I, I think I do, you know, prefer, you know, giving up a little bit of lawn for native plantings, even if it may be a, a pretty small percentage. I, I still think that, um, you know, for consistency, it's something that I'd, I'd, I'd like to see. Um, do you think you can accommodate that? Um, just, yeah, just to restate Amy, Amy's um, comments about the mitigation, I think this is one of those cases where uh, the benefit of elevating what the structure that's, that's non uh, compliant with the with the regulations and has the potential for waterborne debris as it's right on the bulkhead, shifting it back, opening it up, uh, making it FEMA compliant, and by pushing the uh, the septic effluent uh, pretty much over to uh, the other side of, of, of Bayview Road, that uh, those in themselves um, are our mitigation. So it combined with um, the the two to one, I, you know, we'd feel that. Um, that should be sufficient and where we have uh, basically the the like you said the increase is is a p-stone it's not even a a paver uh pervious paver um it's a, a p-stone walkway is really what we're talking about that if we remove the walkway and put a clover lawn in uh we get those numbers back to uh the three to one and really is that the the benefit that we're looking for um for the trade-off for that that pervious p-stone native stone walkway um, so I guess that, that would be my retort to that. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, I have a question or a comment, sure. which is um, your P-Stone walkway is not going to be weed free. It's going to try to grow back to lawn or a weed field or whatever. Um, so there's always going to be the temptation to spray Roundup or something on that to keep the weeds down. Why not just make it lawn and leave it that way? It's because it's going to try to be that way anyway. Yeah. So whenever we, whenever we do, and I've learned this as far as weeds go, the last thing you want to do is deal with weeds. We put down a um, a woven barrier uh, to prevent weeds, so that we it's a no maintenance. So basically, the pea stone would go down over a uh, a weed barrier over a uh, basically a sand bed and not even a um, a hard bed uh, so that it prevents the that kind of growth so there's no maintenance to it so um, I mean that's that's essentially how we deal with the weeds we've learned over the past years that, that uh, if you don't have a weed barrier it's almost impossible to prevent that well um just as a rejoinder, as a longtime homeowner, I, uh, my theory is there is no such thing as no maintenance. And it, that may help for a few years, but eventually it's going to be growing weeds because the fabric barrier will break down and there will be things growing in there. Is there a portion of that pea stone, John, that you'd like to see reduced to lawn? <clears throat> Well, um, you know, I don't have specific opinions about, you know, the, the details, but there's a stretch of pea stone along the western edge there, if I understand the plan right, that it's adjacent to the lawn. And um, I would think that you wouldn't really need that stretch of pea stone to walk to the steps that lawn would be Maybe for some people who like to be barefoot in the summer, the lawn would be a nicer thing. But that I'm just suggesting that that would be a way to address address the issue is give up that stretch of peace stone. Um, I'm not. I'm 
I'm not so concerned about three to one versus two to one myself, but you know, with if we get to a place where we all agree that this is a good plan, that would seem like an easy concession to make. But maybe maybe there are reasons why it's not. Brad, um, a couple of comments that in listening to all of this. Oh, and, and John, one one comment to your concern about the weeds for the pea stones too, that uh, Mark Coleman educated me that a propane tor a torch works wonders on weeds in gravel drives and it doesn't melt them. <laughs> it's wonderful. Well, uh, uh, yeah, I have a I have a weeding torch and I've deployed it and uh, I'm not quite so convinced. I mean, I, I have used weeding to which a fair amount, and it's not as effective as herbicides. And again, maybe maybe that's a solution. And again, I'm not I'm not wedded to the idea, but it's a suggestion. Yeah. Um, so, and Brad, to your point about the three to one, two to one. I, I this is a very difficult lot to begin with. I think, um, given the small size and proximity to the resource area and everything else. I, I think you're really, um, they, they've done a good job from my perspective with the improvements that they are making just on the, um, on the face of what they've posed here. Um, one comment I have for you, Sean, with respect to the, you mentioned there's gonna be pavers underneath the, on the first behind the bulkhead, um, stretchable, stretchable lawn and then pavers underneath to the uh, to the doors into the boathouse area. I, are, are those going to be solid pavers or are you going to have spacing between them for drainage? Uh, I haven't got into the specification of, of what those would be. Um, I would assume that we could we could put uh, uh, we could make them pervious as far as the joints go. All right, good. I think that would help as well. Um, we can so condition that. Yeah. All right. Um, and with that, you know, again, I'm comfortable with the proposed plan as it stands without needing the three to one mitigation. All right. Let me, um, I guess, back up and then ask a question as to um, is the basis for the increase in hardscape, is it a hardship or is it for an environmental benefit? I mean, I, I think we have to establish why we're going to give a variance here. Um, Could you move your question again? Well, we, we, I guess we're giving a variance here, right? And so our, our variance language is, is very concise, in my opinion. It, it really calls for uncommon issuances of variances. And so the, the, the most common times we give them are because there's an environmental benefit to what's being done or it's a hardship. Um, so I, I'm just curious. I, it feels like to me this commission has been giving out quite a few variances in the zero to 50 and I'm a little concerned about that. And so it, it, what is what is the uh, basis of this variance? Yeah, I guess the, the, the Brad, who are you asking? There isn't a bait. Yep. I think probably Sean or you know Amy could chime in too. Yeah, there isn't a, there isn't a basis. I guess I guess the question is just looking at it comparatively. So um, the 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 overage is basically the the, the P stone walkway, and um, you know if if we remove the P stone walkway, it would be uh, the micro clover lawn. So I guess the the uh, what I think of hardscape. Um, I think of uh, impervious areas, um, structures, and where this is a, a, essentially a native stone uh, that is placed rather than uh, a, a micro clover. Uh, they really have the same benefit and the same deficit. And they don't really don't have any value that either one gives to, uh, to the resource area. So to, to, uh, switch one with the other. Um, I wouldn't see that it would provide any more or greater benefit um, to seek relief for a variance. Now, if we were asking for a, a, a paver walkway, um, then I could I could see 
um, calling it uh, calling it something that would be have a little more detriment uh, to the area with with runoff, um, and that it would be more of a structure than uh, a P-stone material. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, and I'm not arguing for necessarily against the three to one here. Um, but when I look at when we look at mitigation, this kind of ran through my mind for this one is it doesn't necessarily mean planting. So they did the two to one for planting. And if they didn't, if they weren't moving the leach field, if they weren't getting the structure out of the B zone, then I would say they absolutely have to do three to one mitigation in terms of planting. However, I think this, I mean, it's, and we're talking small square footages here. Um, I do think that there's other mitigating factors to this that potentially could make up for that, for that last third of mitigation that in my opinion for water quality would would be would be sufficient but that so i don't um i don't think in my opinion we shouldn't discount the other environmental benefits of this um and that they should count as part of mitigation yeah i think that's that's kind of the argument i'm hearing from some of the other commissioners too i'm just not sure it's a separate issue because the um the P stone is is independent of coming from raising the house and from you know putting the, the sewage pumping it up the hill. So it's it, it um, you know again I'm just I'm, there's an increase zero to fifty and and what is the basis of that variance? You know is it a hardship or is it an environmental benefit? So that, that's kind of what I'm, I'm troubling with. Um, so. Any other thoughts from the commission? Brad, if, I'm, if I'm looking at the, yeah, Brad, if I'm looking at the calculations correctly, so we're talking a difference in mitigation of about 120 square feet. Is that right? Because the additional disturbance is 373. So three to one of that would be 100. Um, so it's probably even less than that. And I, and I'm. I mean, the, the fact that they are moving the septic, the leach field um, back is, is in addition to the points that Amy, the other points that Amy just made about the velocity zone and that sort of thing. It seems to me that because we're dealing in such a small area here, that those changes in and of themselves, I think, are significantly greater mitigants than the, uh, the small amount that we would be looking at if we were to go from two to one to three to one. I agree, but it's almost two different arguments. You know, it's um, the septic has to go that way, right? I don't think yeah, so. The, the septic, yeah, the septic doesn't have to be relocated out of the out of the buffer. Um, so right now it's in the buffer. Okay, so it's not. So we're actually we're part. actually moving it. Yeah, it isn't. So we're we're significantly relocating it. And it, again, it's probably another hundred feet. Uh, back on that property, um, closer to to, uh, to Bayview. Yep. Yeah, Ernie, I, I agree. I think that um, we're talking about very small square footages here, but I, I would just urge commissioners to think critically about what does it mean to grant the variance. I, I just, um, you know, it, it's happened a lot, and, and it should be uncommon. And I, and I'd hope that uh, there were things that we could do. Um, so we don't have the grant variances or, or we have, you know, our mitigation requirements and it's that simple. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. 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 And again, you guys all make your cases on a case, a case by case basis. And we've, we've always been told that there's no precedent, uh, and, and each case really stands on its own merits. And, uh, and I think you guys have, have made some good points and talked through everything of all the benefits and the, the small amount. And really we're talking about mitigation, um, for the, for the, for this and not really is, issuing, um, again, it's a case, it's a case by case basis. And I think that the benefits here really, um, 
are, are positive to the to the resource area with everything that we're doing. I, I agree with that, Sean. As I'm looking at your diagram here, you've got a proposed previous walkway that goes from the house structure to uh, the, the um, mitigation bedding. Okay, what if you stopped your, your previous walkway at the steps? How, what would that do to um, your numbers? Because I see actually no reason to have the second half of that previous walkway there. That is about 75 square feet. And then you have to come up with? Well, that uh, would be it's, it's basically. Uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, we could. You know, if if that's um, if if everybody's in agreement that that's what it would take to get this uh, done, we could cut off that last section, that seventy-five uh, square feet from the steps on. And, and then just convert that to the micro clover. That lowers your mitigation number by how much? I mean, how far are you off the three to one when you take that into consideration? You're pretty close. Yeah, it's pretty close. Can you clarify for me, is that just a bit of P-stone that's south of the steps going up the bank? Yes. That's correct. That's similar to what you brought up earlier, John. Yes. Okay, hey, John. So you, you're muted, John. Yeah, it's part of what I was talking about earlier. That gets us... Yep. Close. Why not do it? Okay. Um, yeah, we did, we'd agree to that. All right. Well, I, I feel like it's, it has been a good discussion and at times. It might seem like, you know, I'm nitpicking here, but I, I do think it's important. And, um, and I do think there's some nice site improvements with this proposal. So, um, any last comments from commissioners? Um, I'd just like to make a off the topic comment, which is there are people who are unmuted and are causing interference in the background. People who aren't talking, please mute yourselves. Yeah, it seems to come and go, John. Okay, uh, one more request or comments from the audience. Okay, so I think we've got some pretty good agreement on, on conditions. Um, would one of the commissioners like to make a motion? I'll move to approve the notice of intent for 49 Snow Inn Road with the one change that the Gatestone walkway south of the steps up the bank is converted to um, micro clover lawn. And also with the note that we will, in the order of conditions, include no herbicides, pesticides, or fertilizer on any of the plantings. And, and we also want to add to that, John, that the patio uh, pavers underneath the building be pervious. Thank you. I, I accept the uh, modification. Can I have a second, please? I'll second it. Seconded by Carolyn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes unanimously. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Um, I might have to disappear for a few minutes when I tried to figure out how to mute myself. I took the audio totally out of the meeting. I mean, I took the video totally out of the meeting and on my side also. So I am going to try and um get in again i didn't see the video go out you're here you can mm -hmm. i had still there well none of you are on my screen 
I've got. I don't know. I, I don't know. If where you want to log out, do you, if you want to log out for a minute now that we're between hearings, Carolyn, and try to come back in, that's okay. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. If I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, this was normally we click on a link, and this time um, I'm still in that meeting, so I can't sign in again. I don't know how to get out. This time we had to type in the address. Um, or at least I did. No. Carolyn, you don't have a mic button on the bottom of your screen that you can just click yeah. on? No, I didn't have that little thing to click. I mean, I can mute any of you. Um, okay. So Amy, well, I can't even get in now. Amy, can you give me the meeting number again? Uh, let me email it to you. I can't. Uh, it's on the agenda. Took over my screen. So I don't know how to do that. Well, why don't we just continue the meeting and I don't have to see you? I'll be sorry. Okay, do you, you want me to give you the number or you want to stick with it? I'll stick with it. Okay. All right then. So we'll we'll proceed to the next notice of intent. Are you seeing anything, Carolyn? No, I'm looking at my Yahoo account. You know, if you look at the bottom tab, there's a little orange circle. Do you see that on the on the toolbar? Those are brilliant. I'm sending our webcam request. There. Thank you. Okay. Okay. All right. As I said, okay. your old dogs are slow learners. Well, all kinds of quirky things come up with these things. Um, all right, well, let's proceed with the next notice of intent for 14 Mill Point Road, Map 1, Parcel J1-94, proposed pier ramp and float. Is there a representative here of the project? So now, now you can share your screen if you want. I apologize for that before. Uh, this is Pam Newbert here. I'm here for a shellfish habitat assessment representing the project, and I'm not sure if if Don, Don Monroe is here. I'm not sure if he's on mute. Yeah, there's a few people on mute. You can go ahead and unmute yourselves if you're here for this case. I can try to unmute the callers that I have here. Amy, can you hear me? This is Roger. Roger, I can hear you. Can you talk again? Hello, this is Roger. All right, you're caller number two. I'm just going to edit you. Okay, I, I'll start the hearing. Okay, I'll make the presentation initially. Okay, my name is Roger McNevich. I'm an engineer, postal engineering, representing the Anino family on this uh, peer application located in Herring River. Uh, the project location is just slightly south of Lower County Road on the uh, eastern side of the river. As you can see on the plan, um, we we know going into this project that there's a great deal of scrutiny for such peer projects um, in the town of Howitch. And uh, to start off the, the the project, we know we have to do the hydrographic survey, which is the result you see on the plan, as well as the upland portion of the site and identify all of the resource areas. Quickly going through the resource areas, there's land subject to coastal storm flowage, coastal bank, coastal beach, salt marsh, land under the ocean, and uh, shellfish at the camp, room containing shellfish. Uh, I'm here tonight together with uh, the team. We have uh, one of my colleagues, Don Monroe, who's quite familiar with the dredging um, regulations in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and familiar with working on dredging projects in Howitch. We also have Pam Newbert, uh, senior marine biologist, who prepared the shellfish uh, survey analysis report. And then also uh, Glenn, Glenn Wood, attorney for the applicant. I believe Mr. Renino is also listening in as well as need be if there's questions come up. Now, uh, as you know, we had to go to Waterways Committee and we made application way back in February for a, for a hearing in March. And 
the day before we were to make our presentation, the, the COVID-19 epidemic uh, situation occurred. So we never did get to make a, a no, I'm sorry, sorry. We, we, did, we did make a presentation on February 19th. We did get to make one presentation. And uh, the initial application was for a uh, 90 foot pier, knowing that we did not meet the 80 foot criteria. The site is such that the geometry of the site of the, uh, of the uh, hyd hydrography at the site, as well as uh, other features, did not allow us to meet all of the requirements uh, that, that are listed by the town for uh, pier structures. Namely, uh, we, we could not meet the two and a half foot depth of water at Nemo Water under all parts of the flow in the 80 feet and our initial proposal for waterways was uh, at a slightly different location for the pier but making it about 10 feet longer the um, that first meeting there was quite a robust discussion at waterways and uh, and it was uh, determined that no way shape or form was the waterway committee going to entertain a, a variance for anything greater than the 80 foot criteria so with that uh, being determined, we went back to the drawing board. It shortened the pier to 80 feet, relocated it to the place, to the location on the property that afforded us the uh, the, the furthest uh, extent uh, out into Herring River. And as you can see, even with that situation, we still don't meet the, the, the two and a half feet of, of, of depth in mineral water to the point that we needed to propose dredging, as you can see on the plan, dredging uh, to, to attain the two and a half feet over the footprint that you see on the plan view, which is about 90 square feet. Um, I did meet with uh, John Rendon, your harbor master, a couple of times on the site. Uh, we put uh, white PVC pipes in the corners of the float in the original location, removed those. We did install new ones, uh, which you see out there presently still exists. We'd also stake the center line of the pier uh, uh, alignment. Now, we un understand there's a great deal of uh, concern about dredging projects. And uh, in light of that, uh, Pam Newbert had done an original shellfish survey uh, ha habitat analysis in, in the proximity of the original location of the pier. And then when we shifted the pier location south, then we didn't quite meet the, uh, the coverage area. So Pam more recently went out and did a, a second shellfish survey and produced a report. Uh, unfortunately, that second report was only submitted to the commission uh, today, okay? So we know the commission hasn't had a chance to review that report, but it did contain uh, an augmentation of the original information and Pam's report includes both uh, analysis of sediment in the site, this very comprehensive analysis process done by divers. The site's broken into quadrants. And I'll let, I'll let Pam speak next as to uh, the, the analysis that she performed, uh, both with regard to the sediment and the, uh, and the shellfish habitat uh, that, that she encountered. Uh, is Pam on board now? I am here. Can you hear me okay? Roger? Amy, can Amy, can you hear Pam? Yes. I'm here. I can hear you. Okay. okay Go ahead, Pam. Go ahead, Pam. Okay, so as uh it's it's good to be here again and Roger is accurate in his statement. I performed a shellfish survey initially uh for the project and then when they reproposed the additional work and moved the location, I went back to the site with my crew and worked with, with um, CC and their boat. And we uh, did shellfish sampling in our uh, pattern of where we had a uh, transect down the center line. And then we set up transects running perpendicular and parallel to the center line at every 10 feet. And we collected a sample at every uh, intersect point for 110 samples, including going out 20 feet beyond the seaward most extent of the float, which went out further than the seaward most extent, extent of the proposed uh, dredging area. So looking at the, I suppose I could maybe share my screen 
that would be helpful. Or Roger, I don't know if you have the um, results handy yourself or mapped. I, I don't believe we have the latest uh, uh, yet. I wonder if I can. I can share my screen. I can make you a presenter, Pam. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Is it working? Yep. Yeah, I'm only skeptical. We can make it a little bigger too. So we, we looked uh, for shellfish, which is what we do. And, and these are the results of the shellfish. So we found uh, five cohogs in the footprint of the dredge, uh, in the dredge area where, where, the, where the dredging is, is proposed to take place. And we found a few other cohogs, one, two, three, four, five, another five cohogs outside of the dredge footprint. And we found two oysters. So what uh, two oysters at the edge, one at the edge and one at each of the edges of the dredge footprint and another one here. We surveyed almost, we surveyed all the way over, you'll see in Roger's plan, there's another pier that is uh, very close, not close, but it's, it's um, close to the edge of the transect lines of our, our 50 foot transect lines. And so uh, we were very close to sampling near the existing pier structure as well. Our results suggest that there, there isn't much for shellfish in this area. Uh, our sediment results are here. As you can, uh, the dark gray lines uh, here at the seaward most extent indicate black anoxic mud. The sediment was extremely soft and um, we had it, we had to be very careful where we were sampling because it was that kind of quicksand mud where you would step and then the next thing you know you were up to your waist in mud and needing to be pulled out um, by your colleague. So a uh, safety moment here is don't do this by yourself. So we had some very uh, high uh, sed sediment with high anoxic conditions and that sediment that in the dredge footprint where it was anoxic is the kind of sediment that would be beneficial in my opinion to remove because it is not high quality shellfish habitat and by removing that anoxic sediment you would um, remove the organic content material and would be, and the shellfish habitat would benefit, in my opinion. So I'm ha I'm happy to answer questions um, and talk more about the survey. I think you're probably familiar with my survey methodologies, but I can go through the kind of rake we use. Uh, we use a, a specially made rake that has uh, tines that are that are nine inches long, so that when we take a um, uh, a sample, we get approximately a one foot by one foot area into our basket. The basket is always lined with a quarter inch mesh. So we're, we're looking for any stages of shellfish that we can find, not just the adult stages, but the juvenile stages as well. We do our surveys in a methodology that is uh, repeatable. So our transects are repeatable. You can go out there and set your center line and repeat exactly if, for, for scientific purposes. You can go out there and set your center line just like we did and set your transects every 10 feet as well and repeat the survey. So we try to do, we, we do our surveys. We don't try, we do our surveys in a methodology that's repeatable and scientific. If I can augment uh, Pam's comments, uh, and Amy's aware of this, uh, you, you did get comments from John Rendon and Heinz Prof regarding uh, uh, the results of the analysis by the, uh, the Waterway Committee. And if I recall, and I know Amy has the, uh, it was an email from Heinz Prof that uh, he has endorsed the project. Uh, he didn't seem to have uh, concern for what we're proposing to do here. And 
I'm sure that's, that, that uh, email is available to the commissioners as well. It was in, it's been in their Dropbox for quite some time. Okay. As far as geometry, uh, uh, we, we know the regulations as far as uh, chapter 91 and uh, Army Corps, the height and the, the width, uh, the, the pier decking is proposed to be uh, through flow decking uh, with five feet above mean high water. The deck is six feet above uh, the salt marsh. Uh, our, our design includes uh, very long spans over the salt marsh to the point we only need uh, one pile bent within the, within the salt marsh. The salt marsh is a essentially 52 feet wide in this location we minimize the maximum extent possible in fact we're proposing to use uh, prefabricated aluminum uh, the pier spans uh, similar to uh, what would be manufactured for a uh, long boat ramp uh, kind of situation to, to minimize uh, uh, impact on the salt marsh it's about 1.6 1.7 square feet of impact of a footprint of the two piles we're proposing in within the salt marsh as you can see on the plan uh, the profile down below shows all the dimensions that uh, relate to the project you can see how we span uh, the salt marsh itself we're 80 feet uh, from mean high water to the outermost uh, sea or river edge of the, of the float system the the pier structure starts up the coastal bank somewhat. The coastal bank uh, that exists at the site is essentially a lawn area. Uh, as can be seen uh, in the photograph uh, in the plan view. We're 25 feet off the property line, uh, at least 65 feet off the neighbor's uh, float to the south. To the extent that we could meet regulations we have, but we know we, we, uh, we need to ask, ask relief on the dredging as proposed uh, on the plan. All right, Amy, would you like to give us a summary? Uh, yeah, first I have a couple of questions. This plan um, went in front of waterways on, what was the date, the 15th of July? It was, uh, yes, yes, about two weeks so, ago. I ha you have a revision date on this plan. Well, you have a July 28th one too, because that's the top of the bank. But you have a revision date of 714, and that was the change of peer location. And I just want to make sure that the Waterways Committee reviewed this plan and not the one that was provided to us earlier with the different location. And also, yep. they were provided with the correct shellfish analysis. Um, the one that we got just yesterday or earlier today was that shellfish report, the one provided to Heinz, the Waterways Committee, John Rendon. The shellfish report that the Waterways Committee had was the first one, which didn't quite extend over into this area. Okay, so I do have a little bit of concern about that just in terms of consistency. They were reviewing, it is the same property, but it's not the same dock location. Um, and the shellfish results were, were different when you compare the two. Um, so I would first recommend that this be provided at least to Heinz for further review. And I would like additional um, comments from him based on this particular location yeah I just think we all need to be looking and reviewing the same exact bit of information um, and then in terms of uh, the other parts of the project so the division of marine fisheries wrote a letter stating that you know shading is a concern with impacts um, with uh, with docks and I've seen this more consistently now that they're recommending the one and a half to one instead of the one to one. And the one and a half to one really is from the bottom of the stringer to the marsh. Um, that's per their letter, not the decking. Um, and so I think that potentially would have to change a couple of things here. Your plan does show, when I look at section AA, it shows five feet from 
basically the marsh to um I can't tell if that's a stringer or if that's the bottom of the decking, but I would recommend um, it's the underside of the of the stringer. It's the underside of the stringer. That's the okay. minimum clearance. And it's from mean high water the uh, criteria. Yep. So they're recommending measuring from the bottom of the support stringer over the salt marsh. Um, okay. Um, but still, I think you're showing, are you showing five feet? We're showing five feet. So that would, it would be, it would have to go up a foot. Okay. I mean, we can do that. That's easy enough. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just, so these are things that Kenton may or may not agree with, but just some observations for me. Um, and just for my own edification, because we don't see this too often. Um, well, it, we, we got that sediment result, um, report from Alpha Analytical for the other location for the pier. Is there a need um, to look at that again, or is what Pam... Pam's observations of the sediment quality, is that sufficient for your 401, um, your water quality certifications? I think uh, Pam might be able to speak to that, Pam, please. Okay, can you hear me uh, at all? Can you still hear me? Um, uh, the sediment samples that we took were visual sediment samples and for the water quality. Uh, Roger, you'll, you'll need to take a couple of sediment samples to, to meet those requirements. You'll have to do a grain size analysis from at least one okay, sample. Yep. So that, it's a small. Sure. Okay. It's a small. Okay. So that's just another, another item. Um, in my narrative for the commission, I kind of went through all the performance standards just because this one, um, there's quite a few resource areas here. You've got coastal bank, you know, land subject to coastal storm flowage, coastal beach, river front, salt marsh, coastal beach, land underwater bodies, fish runs. You pretty much have the gamut of uh, saltwater resources here. So the commission does have all that. Um, so I'm not gonna go through that in, in length um i would just state um one of my concerns was impacts to salt marsh you do have a, a decent width of salt marsh here and one of my two of my questions i basically have to do with um how this pier is constructed is there are there ways that we could further minimize potential negative impacts to salt marsh as a result of putting this back in um and is it possible to well one you've already got a um would like to see you try to raise it up some more. Is there a way for you to span the marsh without pilings in the marsh? And is there the possibility, um, the commission is seeing more and more of these, is that for this location, would a monopile dock design um, be feasible given the location of the river? And you don't necessarily have to answer those all right now, just something to think about. And Mr. Chairman, I think that's what I've got for now. Recall, Amy, you had, you had mentioned that to me, and I had written a uh, a design philosophy letter to the commission uh, addressing uh, the basis of our design and why we feel uh, monopile uh, design uh, it, it's just getting too uh, too lean for the. The spans we're dealing with here, there's a tremendous load. Uh, um, yeah. And that's from a structural point of view, uh, we, we we're uncomfortable going to a monopile system. Uh, I'm not a I'm not an engineer, so that's why I'm asking yeah. the questions. I thought that you had said that the um, monopot. I thought in, it was more in reference to the next project that we're going to be talking about on our agenda that a mile pile might not be the best way to go there because of the velocity of the river, but I may have. That, 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 I did say that that's a, that was a different reason. This reason here is uh, we're trying to minimize the number of piles yep. in the salt marsh. And if we, if we revise this design to a monopile system, then I've got to reduce the, sp the, the spans because we're 26 feet already. 
Okay. I switched to mono pile, then I'll, I'll still have two piles in the salt marsh because yeah. they won't be side by side. They'll be longitudinally along the pier. It's just you can only do so much with a, with a, a design, yeah. and it's getting pretty lean, I guess. Yeah. I understand. So really, the options are is like the traditional design, like you have here with the the two piles going along, you know, either side of the structure. Um, Potentially, if you were to have this as you've proposed here, you could potentially eliminate those middle pilings and span it. Or the option would be to go to a monopile, but with more pilings actually in the marsh itself. Correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it, there's a the possibility. At, at, at the end of the pier, we always have to have two piles at, at the, of course. the end of the pier. Uh, but you potentially could remove. Uh, if I'm looking at section AA, the ones that are in the, the center of the dock here, if you were to keep the dock more of a traditional dock design. So this, this is a traditional dock design showing the two piles right. at the mid, midpoint. Right. It, we, we would have to add an additional pile bent if we went to monopile system. Okay. The 26 foot span is just too much for a monopile system. Take, in our, take, in our take a comment about the monopile off the table for now. Okay. Okay. Don't think about monopile. Right. If you went with this, th this traditional design, could you remove those middle? No, those no, that's, that's, that's not how you're going to. That's a 52 foot span. That's. I didn't that's, think so. I just wanted to ask the question. <laughs> so, okay. I'm, I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay. I guess we'll, we'll go through comments from the commissioners, starting with Stan. Okay. I got a lot of them. Um, I want to first start off by just clarifying that there was no presentation to the Conservation Commission back in february that must have been what you're talking about waterways this is our this is our initial hearing waterways committee right from our standpoint this is our initial hearing um, All right. second thing is i'm very concerned about impact on the marsh um i know we just talked so we're not going to talk about monopile monopile docks and I'm not an engineer or an expert, but the ones, the one monopile at dock I've seen, from what I can see, there's been no impact on the marsh or scouring. Uh, could be a, a number of factors besides the dock itself, the height of the dock. It could be um, other factors that I'm not aware of. But in that one instance, I've been very impressed with the outcome. On traditional docks that I've seen on the river, there always tends to be some shading and scouring taking place where there is an impact on the marsh. Um, so that's all I'm gonna say about that. Um, I don't wanna to talk too much about the, the survey because I've just seen it, but I do have a lot of questions about it. When I look at that grid, Pam, um, I, it, it was hard for me to tell from the legend what, what's actually going on there as far as where they were saw, uh, you know, the grids and it looked like there was a lot of the grid that was not showing any shellfish. That, that's accurate. There was a good portion of the grid that did not have shellfish. Now, my question is, is that the grid that is that gr grid including the, ha the whole salt marsh area? The grid does include the salt marsh area, yes. So you're not really even measuring shellfish in the salt marsh, right? Well, uh, no, we're not digging up the salt well, marsh. Kind of, we kind of, so we're, so we're, if you look at that major grid, we're only looking at a real small piece of that out by the river more. Correct? You're, so, you're looking at the center line and then out 50 feet to the north and 50 feet to the south of where the proposed 
uh, structure and where the flow would be. Can you put this sir, back to the survey on the screen? Yes, well, you have, you have to give me a minute here to get the system going. Hold on a second. Well, it shows on my screen. It just you can't just scroll through this. I think it's a little bit. Uh, I'm learning. I'm not a go-to oh. meeting. I'm not yeah. uh, as familiar with go-to meeting well, as I am. One of them. So you see all those green dots. I mean, that's really not measuring anything, right? Because that's where the marsh is or the well, salt it's marsh. Really, it's indicating where the marsh is located. So I think that's important. And it shows well, yeah, so I mean, it, 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 it kind of waits really when you look at this, you don't, wouldn't expect to see the fish, shellfish in the marsh itself. It's a small area off to the, out in the river. Well, I, I, I think that that's a good point in the sense that the shellfish habitat is, is in this area here, not in the salt marsh. And uh, you know, we're looking, to, we're looking 20 feet well beyond the extent of where the, the boat will be kept at the float and well, we're going well. beyond the, the, the dredge footprint. Well, what I'm trying to say is when you look at that overall grid, the shellfish are actually more dense than what this grid would suggest because the grid is really much smaller. You're talking about sample size. Sample size, right. Sure. And the other thing is from what I could tell is when you were talking about that anoxic material right around where the float would be, it looked like you were showing just either side of the float, you found some shellfish, if I, if I read the picture right. I, I, I think that that's okay, because when we sampled next to the existing float, then in, in existing pier that is about 65 feet away, we, we did look around the existing structure while we were there. We didn't include it in our sample grid but we also found shellfish. It's not uncommon to find shellfish around dock structures. Shellfish, I, I'm a, a, a proponent that shellfish and docks can coexist. And I've seen in some cases where there are more shellfish around the dock structure. No, that, that, wasn't, the, that wasn't the point I was trying to make. So, so it sounded like what you're saying is that one little spot where the flow was, is where the, the, the river bottom was bad. Uh, where you're saying the dredging was, because right on either side of it, there was shellfish. That, you can have shellfish in anoxic mud. It's just not typically what happens. And what we saw here was you have the adult stages that have the thicker shells that can tolerate the anoxic conditions and they can, and their shells are, are thicker. So you won't have, when the juveniles set in this anoxic condition, the hydrogen sulfide content is very high, and that's why it smells like rotten eggs. When the juvenile stage is set in this anoxic condition, their shells are much thinner. And so the shells of the juveniles erode and the animals die. And so it's not optimal because it doesn't support that younger stage of shellfish because the sediment in and of itself is anoxic and high in hydrogen sulfide, which makes the sediment acidic and not good for organisms that have calcium carbonate uh, in their structure. Okay. Well, one, I guess one other comment about shellfish is that we've, we've had two instances where we talked, we were kind of, I don't want to say bend the rule, but we, we took the exception and permitted, and it was based on getting some shellfish studies to see what the impacts are over a long time. Um, I've not seen any of those results yet because they haven't happened yet. We, only one of those docks has actually been built at this point a year ago, and I don't know if any of that sampling has been done. I haven't seen any results from that. 
And the other dock hasn't been built yet that we were going to get data from. So without, I, I have a real problem to keep uh, trying to improve or approve more docks without getting results of data that we requested initially to see what the impact is from, from them. I think that the client, that the applicant would be, uh, we would have to speak with the applicant, but he would be agreeable to a follow-up study. It does take time. No, 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 I'm saying I'm waiting for the studies from the ones we've already asked for. I haven't done I mean, them yet. Time, we, we, keep getting, we keep getting promises, but I don't have any data yet. I would be, I would be more than happy to assist those clients with their shellfish studies. Please give them my number. Well, I think you were involved in the first one that you said that. I, I tend, <laughs> I tend to do studies, but the follow-up studies, perhaps they, I tend, I, I do things in a very scientific way, and and you know, I have a PhD in marine biology, and I look at things in a very rigorous way, and and uh, I can't, I I can't make promises that the clients will hire my services for the future. I can only do what I'm hired to do. Right. Well, like I, say, one of, like I say, one of the docs hasn't even been built yet, and the other was that, that required a study, and the other one was, and I don't know if the results should have been sent in by now yet, Amy, but that's a different that's a different question for another time. That I, I, I don't think we can wait, or we shouldn't wait for this. I, I mean. Well, no, I'm saying that's not part of this discussion. I mean, that, that has to be, be followed up on. But um, so those are my concerns. Um, like, I, I guess I really have to have a better understanding of this last survey that we did and what we're really seeing with the limited area that we're talking about of this major of this overall grid. And like I say, I still think that docks will impact the marsh. And because I've seen it, I look at it all the time now, because in the last few years, I've done a lot more kayaking on that Herring River, and I've become more and more aware of the impacts of the docks on the salt marsh, because I see it all the time. And I guess that's the, all the comments I have for tonight. All right, thank you, Stan. Uh, John, do you have any comments for us? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have comments and questions for primarily for Dr. Newbert on the uh, shellfish survey. Um, I did have some time this afternoon to look at the revised new survey and um, first, and this is sort of following on what Stan had to say or his questions about the survey. First off, it looks to me like you could separate the area, the survey area into two pieces. One is the inland piece, which is salt marsh, and the other is the, the piece uh, uh, away from the salt marsh, and they're about half and half, maybe a little more area in the salt marsh, and basically, uh, looks to me like you found no shellfish in the salt marsh, but you did uh, take samples in in that basically five or six thousand square feet. You took samples there and found nothing. Is that correct? Uh, we we took our samples. I want to I want to see if I can answer that question in a different way. We, we we took our samples where each of these points were located. There. We, we don't dig up the marsh to uh, take shellfish samples. The, the, the state, the performance standards for the state do indicate that if there are impacts to land containing shellfish, if the shellfish can be restored to their original condition within one year, then the project is allowable and, and permittable and the project would meet the performance standards. 
So the number of shellfish that we found at this site is, in my opinion, that this could easily be, if, if there were five shellfish in the dredging footprint, we could easily mitigate for the loss of the five shellfish that might be in that dredge footprint. Okay, wait a minute. That, that's not what I was asking you, though. And, and I didn't understand your answer to my question. You did take samples at all those points in the salt marsh. Is that correct or not? We take, uh, we do not dig up the salt marsh or peat because we do not want to, um, and we well, don't I want to those in samples. Them. There were no samples. We, we investigate the sample, we look at the site, but we do not take our rake and dig through the salt marsh because we do not want to injure or cause damage or cause holes in the salt marsh habitat. That's oh, that's, so you there. In other words, there's no information here about whether there were shellfish in it's salt. It's a marsh. visual assessment. It's a visual. You're assessment. just looking at the surface. We we look at the surface and we look if we can get a little bit below the surface. We look there, but the the peat and the habitat in the salt marsh. I think it's a mistake to think that we don't have any samples there. The The substrate is not supportive of shellfish because the peat is very thick. And it's important to keep the integrity of the salt marsh uh, and not yeah, dig through it. Okay, I understand that, but that's not at all clear in the report that you wrote there. So, okay, so then I just want to talk about the samples you took where you actually took samples, which is for, the, oh, you know, seaworth uh, from the salt marsh. Let's just talk about that for the moment. That is another um, approximately 5,000 square foot area where you took approximately uh, 50 samples. And so, and my understanding of what you're describing is that you're sampling a one square foot area at, at each of those points and digging down. And yeah. basically you're taking one square foot of sample for every hundred square feet of area there. That is, you're taking a sample in a 10 by 10 box and that's hundred square feet. So what you have is you're sampling essentially 1% of the area there over 5,000 square feet. And what your report says, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in that area, that 5,000 square foot area, you found 14 coal hogs, four oysters, two horseshoe crabs, and three soft shell clams. Is, is that correct? Yes, uh, yes, that's correct. But so since you're only sampling 1% of the area, it is, uh, reasonable to assume unless you can tell me otherwise that you're sampling one percent of the area and those are reasonable samples of the shellfish in the area so basically to assess the total number of shellfish in that five thousand square feet you would multiply those sample amounts by a hundred so so that, so that is not an accurate way to look at things because shellfish have uh, the, the sampling protocols are the same protocols that I used for Turner and Fall that were permitted, and shellfish have have uh, are dispersed. It, it, it's not a, 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 a it's not a scientific assumption to make that. If you find one cohog in one square, you'll find them everywhere in that 100 foot so, square. So what you're doing is statistical sampling here. You're sampling 1% of the area and you did it over 50 points. And should we be assuming that that's representative of mm -hmm. the shellfish in the area or not? And if not, why not? Well, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question again. I don't know how else to interpret this process other than to interpret it as you're, you're sampling 1% of the area, you're coming up with representative counts of shellfish in 1% of the area, and the only way to make a conclusion about the total number of shellfish in the area is to take those as statistical samples and then assume that it's roughly evenly spread. Um, 
you know, it might not be exactly 100 times, it might be less, it might be more, but I don't know how we would conclude. It certainly seems uh, entirely clear to me that it's not correct to, to conclude that there are only 14 cohogs in that whole 5,000 square foot area. It's, to, I don't see how you can conclude that it's anything other than roughly 100 times that many, that many. We're not cohogs. making any assumptions or, or extrapolating. We're just presenting the results that we found here at the site. We're presenting the information that we found that this look, it's impossible to sample every single square inch of the area. This is a, a, a methodology that I've been using, not only here, but throughout uh, all of Cape Cod, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, to get a, an assessment, an accurate assessment of where the shellfish might be in relation to the pier. We're not saying or extrapolating anything more than we found some shellfish and the shellfish that we found uh, are no different than the numbers of shellfish we found for other piers that have been permitted in the past. And therefore, uh, at the, and the client is willing to, or the applicant is willing to take into consideration shellfish mitigation for the, and we found in some cases, we, we find more shellfish adjacent to the pier structures than we do uh, in areas outside of the pier structures. We're not denying that we didn't find, we find shellfish, we report it. Um, but it's improper scientifically to extrapolate uh, information and, and just blanketly multiply the number of shellfish found to the whole area, in, so, in my scientific opinion. Okay, so then do you have alternative models? I mean, the thing we struggle with here and what Stan was referring to previously to me is how do we draw conclusions based on this limited sampling data? And I, I, I would assume, and perhaps I'm wrong, that you have statistical models that uh, you have some models for how shellfish are distributed in an area and how to draw general conclusions from a limited sampling like as you say you can't dig the whole place up but i hope you won't tell me that i should conclude that there are only 14 cohogs in that whole area because that seems like entirely the wrong conclusion to draw the conclusion i draw is that it's more like 1400 unless you can present to me some compelling argument about why that's not the way to think about it or give me some other numbers some other some other conclusion that is, uh, not the way to think about it because i think you would be you know you have the i, I would say that this is one of the most ex, this methodology is one of the most extensive survey protocols that comes in front of the howard Con conservation commission i know that other shellfish biologists go out and take random samples, they take 10 or 12 samples, projects get permitted. This is a, a scientific study that's looking at samples at, at, at up to 110 samples. Uh, I know for a fact that you permitted projects with much fewer samples than what I take. And uh, yeah, I'm not questioning that. So let me just ask you one other question, which is, uh, what would you expect the density of shellfish to be in a healthy, say, cohog gap uh, habitat? Um, I think that is a site-specific question, and it depends on the location. It's it's a really difficult uh, question. It depends on sediment consistency in, in areas that I see here. For example, in the anoxic mud areas, I would expect that over time you would have zero cent shellfish there. That the shellfish that would be living in that anoxic mud condition would eventually perish and you would not have a juvenile set in that anoxic mud area. So my question about that is... 
why you wouldn't have shellfish in the air. I mean, we're talking about uh, where the linear structure is of the pier. You would still have the same shellfish that were identified there with the pier structure. I mean, keep in mind, we're going 50 feet to the north and 50 feet to the south of the structure, much further beyond where I, I don't want that to, to, um, to bias the opinion. We're looking at a very large area for identifying where the shellfish may be located relative to this. If we had just looked at the center line, then we wouldn't have any shellfish at all, but the areas where we do find shellfish are outside of the impact of the proposed project. Okay, I, I would just like to comment that I would really like to understand what the significance of these numbers are, and I don't find your responses to be particularly helpful in that respect. So uh, I think what I can conclude here is you found some shellfish. It's clear that there's some density of shellfish there. Um, and I'm left on my own basically sort of extrapolating that data in some, some kind of general sh shellfish density here. And to me, it seems to be a significant density of shellfish. John, uh, this is Glenn Wood, uh, counsel for the applicant. I guess I'm confused because Pam's survey and protocol is exactly following the way that this CONCOM has required protocols to be done for years. She's set the tone for protocols for this CONCOM and on the gate. This exact protocol has been followed with every application that Pam and Coastal and myself and even Mark Burgess have submitted to this CONCOM now for years. This is the exact same protocol that this commission found totally acceptable and approved for Turner, a couple properties to the south and Thaw. So I guess I'm confused as to your confusion. We're doing the exact same way that we've always done it. So, and the focus is not on density. The focus is trying to figure out where there's viable sediment. It's the quahogs in the subtidal zone in particular, where there's gonna be prop wash are gonna be impacted. Um, of course, we're not gonna sample in the salt marsh. We never do. We did it in Turner, we did it in Fall, we did it in any other project that this commission has approved that I've been involved in. So. I guess I'm not following your, your, your questioning here. I'm doing it the same exact way we've done it for years. Well, this is Stan. I'd like to comment on that. Um, first of all, there's only been one dock that we're talking about that's been sampled that I've been on this commission during. So I, don't, I can't speak for other statistical sampling that's been done in the past. But I've also learned as we, every time we come across one of these things, we become more knowledgeable. For example, we brought up other questions like when is sampling done? What time of the year? Has somebody been shellfishing in the area? There's no real statistical, a good statistical approach to ways shellfish samples are done, in my opinion. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, today, when I brought that question up, it's something that I felt differently for the first time compared to the other time, as far as the density. And I personally agree with John. You can't just say, because I don't know what conclusion I can make from the way it's being done right now, if you're just saying you're taking 1% of the area. I agree with John. I don't know what the answer is, but it's definitely more than 12, 12 shellfish. Well, that, that's fine, Sam, but put it in your regs. It's not in your regs. We're following the protocol that your regs on the books have presently. If you want to change the protocol for how you do it, it's about if there's shellfish in the area, the docks aren't permitted. I'm saying we're following the same exact protocol that we've done for other projects that this commission has, in fact, endorsed that Pingham has done. 
including By most way, recently Tom uh, Fall and Turner. He's trying to I'm talk. Not arguing. I am not arguing with the protocol. I am simply trying to understand the result of the protocol. That was the entire thrust of my questions here. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't have done that. We're trying to draw the conclusion, as Stan says, about whether there's significant shellfish in the area. That was the thrust of all my questions. I was just trying to understand the results of Pam's protocol. And, and I think there are legitimate questions, and the same questions came up when we did these other things. We didn't have good answers. Amy's got her hand up. Hi, Amy. Hi, can I make a can I have make a comment or ask a question? Mm -hmm. Well, two things. First, if we could all try not to talk over each other, that would be great. Um, maybe use say through the chair so we know who's talking when. That would be really helpful. Um, this doesn't need to be argumentative or anything. I think what in, in my when I'm listening to this, what it comes what it sounds to me is like what is what the crux of it seems to be well what is this whole purpose of the the shellfish um survey that's being done um what is the purpose to the commission and i mean the purpose is to provide in in my opinion based on our reg is to provide a sample a random sample because this is done on a grid so it is um unbiased it is done on a grid um, I hear what your point is about not physically digging in the marsh and that it's a visual sample, but you are still taking an assessment there. Um, not the same necessarily as digging, but I think it's fair to say that you're, you're looking at seeing, as Pam said, you want to see what's there. This gives a idea of the sediment composition. It gives, um, because Pam acknowledges that in her survey, but it also gives a sample, a description of what you, what she found. And you can extrapolate from that, maybe not, you know, directly a hundred times, but you can say, okay, this was found in this area. This is what I can expect to find in this area. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I mean, it makes it, it does make it hard to quantify, but we also don't have a definition. Nobody has a de definition for what is significant shellfish habitat. Um, so I hear what everybody is saying, but I think it, instead of just numbers, it has to come down to um, that we have them do this survey to supplement the maps that the state and the town um, have for shellfish to help determine if um, it's suitable shellfish habitat or and based on and I mean and I guess our own definition of what is significant but um, I guess that's all I have to say so thank you thank you Amy Carolyn did you have a comment I do have a question on this um, where it says if you can restore the site to the same uh, selfish quality within a year, we can give a, um, a variance. But if we don't know what the number of shellfish in that area is, we only know 1%. Um, how do we how do we judge that it can be restored to that same situation within a year? So, Mr. Wood, if you've listened to our our conservation meetings, you would know that we have we have um, been discussing this issue, and just because other things have been approved, does not reflect exactly on each project. Agreed. And in fact, Pam actually during the Turner and Thal hearings uh, offered her pro bono services to help you review possible reg changes. So I'm fully aware of that point. Well, then any, how, any how do we determine what state it has to get to a year from construction? How do we decide well, that the site is now 
exactly where it was a year before. Can I, to the chair, may I uh, offer some some words? Yes. On that? Thank you. So Pam here again, I think that when you do the mitigation, when, when you have the funding and your shellfish constable does the mitigation and, and he offers his opinion that the project will not have a significant impact and, and you offer the mitigation, you're doing it in orders of magnitude more, you're buying seed that is orders of magnitude more than what would be found, you know, if you said not only what we observe, but what could be observed. So you're putting in shellfish in orders of magnitude more. But the problem is, is that when you have that seed, and if you're putting that seed on, on sediment that is anoxic, that seed will not set, they will not survive. And so it's really important, it's, it's, a, it's a two part problem. I understand that there's shellfish, and, but there's also sediment and, and there's water quality. And I've said this many, many times, the key to better shellfish habitat is improvement to the water quality. And so while you are doing things and, and the town has done, made some great strides, towards improving water quality. I've seen it over the years, cleaning up the sewers and the drains and, 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 but still it starts with improvements to water quality. And then it, it, it could continues on to improvements with the sediment quality. And so if you can improve the sediment by removing that, which is highly organic and not suitable for shellfish, then you with let's take the pier aside. If you can remove sediment that's highly anoxic, then that's going to benefit not just shellfish, but fish in and of itself. It's it's a benefit to take out the anoxic mud, which doesn't provide any habitat except for bacteria and 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 have it be a more naturally occurring sandy type habitat um, that would be improved for not just shellfish but fish itself. The noxic habitat does not do any benefit to habitat for organisms in general. And, it, and it's by no fault of any of us here, it's years and years of eutrophication and, and organic loading into the Herring River and, but now you have regulations to help with that. And that's going to, uh, that will continue on. And, and thank you. Any further questions or comments, Carolyn? Um, I, I just want to say that I'm, I'm concerned about the vast expanse over the salt marsh and that uh, we do uh, recede for the, the shellfish, but I think it'll take a lot longer for that salt marsh to, or maybe never, um, come back to where it was. So I'm, I'm a little concerned about the design of the, uh, about the expanse over the uh, salt marsh. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you. Ernie, any comments or questions? Yes, I do. Um, and I, I, I won't dwell on, on shellfish surveys on this, um, but to Carolyn's point about the salt marsh, it, it, if I, if we look at our regulations, I know that there is a provision in our regs that says any structure proposed for siting in a salt, salt marsh will not destroy any portion of the salt marsh. Um, just by virtue of putting a piling, two pilings in the, in the salt marsh, I think we've, we've already got um a situation where we would have to grant a variance to, to that provision that's in our regulations um the other question i have is with res most of my questions i think are with respect to the dredging um can someone tell me how often this area would have to be redredged to maintain the two and a half foot depth Uh, this is Roger. Um, I think once the area is dredged, that material is is so light. I and it's taken many many years to deposit. I don't think with uh, uh, 
now uh, boating activity that there would be a need for many years that would need to be dredged. All right. And uh, how would we know when there would have to be additional dredging done there? I think at, uh, at a low tide, it would be evident. You could see it. You, you would know because you can see what they, what Nemo water is now. It's at the surface of the, uh, you know, the elevation of the float as it presently exists on the plan. That's Nemo water. Yeah. All right. So currently, um, if I read the the rationale for, for the dredging, um, by moving it to a total length of only 80 feet, Without dredging, then the landward side of the float would be aground essentially at being all water. Is that correct, Roger? Yes, that's correct. Yes. All right. Then looking at your plan for dredging, you've essentially got a two and a half foot cut directly behind the float. Uh, and, yes. and that cut is based on Pam's information in sandy mud and uh, actually it's all sandy mud there. I, I'm just not confident that that cut will actually uh, sustain itself. It would seem to me that that cut eventually, with the with the current flows and everything else, is going to move landward. Possibly, yes, possibly. So what we'd be ending up doing, if I look at the area of the, the anoxic mud that's presently outlined on the uh, plan that you have here, it runs right along the back edge of that flow. So as that cut dissolves or or, or uh, moves landward, I'm going to assume that the anoxic mud will follow it. Again, I don't know um, what basic. Perhaps Pam can speak to that. Uh, to, to the chair, that's not necessarily the case. If the town is doing making measures to uh, making measures to improve water quality through uh, septic uh, through better quality septic system measures and, and managing uh, runoff and, and improving uh, permeable surfaces and implementing the measures that have been implemented over the last several years to improve the water quality i wouldn't make the assumption that the that the uh, anoxic sediment once it's removed will necessarily come back or move more close to shore. What I can say is that we have sea level rise, and 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 so the we will ultimately the river is going to rise, and so there will be more water depth, and so it's potentially a possible that dredging may not necessarily be as frequent as whatever Roger proposes, but there's no doubt that sea level is rising and climate is changing, in my opinion. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I, I'm just uncomfortable with the, with the proposal that you presented to us for the dredging, because I think it's unrealistic to assume that that cut that's directly behind the float in order to attain the two and a half feet is going to retain is going to maintain itself. Um, I think we're we're looking at some additional impacts to that area, um, and I don't know how that will impact uh, the flow of the anoxic mud, which is directly uh, adjacent to that. Actually, it's it's in the anoxic mud in, in many cases. Um, and the fact that you've got the sandy, sandy mud that's there right now, I think that's going to be deteriorating um, with the dredging taking place there. Uh, yeah. Um, any other any other comments, Ernie? No, I think that was primarily it for now. So those two are my big concerns. Okay. Um, let me go through my list of comments fairly quickly, I think. Um, first of all, in terms of Dr. Newbert's surveys, you know, in my time here, we've had just three vendors produce shellfish surveys for us, and I, I think that Pam does um, the best job among those those three vendors, and I think it's uh, it's comprehensive. And so I think the trouble that some of us are having is more with the interpretation of the results and, and, and how you draw your conclusions from those results. I do think that all three surveyors do not do a great job with soft shell clams and there's a couple reasons for this but that's almost a different subject 
but um, AM's frequency of sampling is very high, and so I, I do think it's it's it, it is a good survey. Um, I guess the point I want to make, um, just clearly, if I can, is that I, I just don't think this location is a very good location to put a dock in. It, it's close to Low County Bridge. Your velocities pick up at that location, and so you're going to have erosional forces. And if you look at section, the, the map view on section A A, I, I just see a lot of uh, direct impacts and erosional impacts to shellfish habitat, salt marsh, and possibly coastal bank. So I just want to be clear that, that um, I'm, I will have trouble supporting this location. Um, and that, and further, I think um, there was a comment from uh, Pam in, in regards of shellfish doing well with structure. I think it's really important for the commissioners to realize that that just relates to oysters. And throughout Herring River, you'll see erosional impacts that do degrade quahog in soft shell clam habitat. So oysters maybe, blue mussels maybe, but for those other two species, I, I just see routine impacts to their habitat and their population. So that, that's an important point. Um, another point I think I'd like to make is that I think seeding is an option, but it, it doesn't really matter if you degrade the habitat. So I, I think it's the commission's responsibility to protect the habitat first. And, um, you know, seeding is something that can be done if, if that ends up being the mitigation, but really our, our first job is to protect habitat. Um, what else? Anoxic mud. Um, I think that term is used a lot. I don't think there's a lot of sampling going on. Is it hypoxic? Is it anoxic? Certainly it's degraded, but um, I was out there in March and I got a recreational limit of cohogs in about 45 minutes and the densities increased as you went towards the bridge, but I, there were still cohogs that were readily you know, captured in the footprint um, and, and in the mud, off the mud. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if anoxic mud is, is really something it um, is always anoxic mud. Sometimes it's degraded, sometimes it's epoxic. So I just wanted to make that point too. So those are my my points. I, I think there's been a lot of concerns raised tonight. Um, I guess I'd like to first ask if there are any comments from the audience, then I'll ask the proponents if they want to come back on any of these comments. Any, any comments from the audience? Is it, it's my opportunity, this is Pam again uh, to the chair, it's my opportunity to voice, uh, to, to respond to your comments or, or is this for the audience only? Well, I just want to see if there's anybody in the audience who hasn't spoken that would like to, and, and if not, then I think, yes, it would be your opportunity um, to okay. respond. I, I'd say seeing none, then yeah, by all means, please proceed. I just want I just want to say that I disagree. I think that I, I, in my experience doing this over the last 20 odd years, I have gone to many docks, many piers, and I have found higher densities of, in particular, soft shell clams around pilings and, and, and structures. It's not just it's not just oysters and mussels, but it's soft shells and, and I found cohogs. And in fact, I, as I mentioned, I found cohogs around the neighbor's pier, which was sitting on the seafloor surface at the time at low tide. It's much, uh, it, the neighbor's pier float is much more uh, towards, near, towards the shore. It's, it doesn't extend as far into into the Herring River, and we found shellfish around the float. We probably would have found shellfish if we could get under the float. We probably would have found shellfish underneath it. So I think that we just have we. Uh, my opinion differs than yours, Brad, in the sense that I've seen shellfish higher densities of shellfish in and around pilings not just the ones that you mentioned, not just the species. Right, well, I, I, I could accept that we have a distant opinion, but I think, you know, my observations are, are just c completely counter to what you just said, you know, and that's in Wichmere Harbor, Allen's Harbor, Herring River, and particularly under floats, you know, the, the boat action, the float action causes scouring that leads to a little, a, a, a fine sediment um, pocket but you, you won't find much at all there. So I, what I'm seeing is direct impacts to those two species. 
um, in these three water bodies. So I, you know, it, it, it's in part a difference of opinion. It's a part in difference of observations over time. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, may I, Mr. Chair? Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I mean, Pam has offered to assist with us. Maybe Heinz would be willing to assist too. I think it is really about time to maybe look, um, you know, the town has a lot, uh, has landings and structures and the rivers and our, um, in our harbors and maybe, I mean, not to hold up this project necessarily, but I think it might be a good side project to really start looking at structures, maybe get permissions from property owners who might have docks to do a little bit of digging around. I mean, but also you have to, you kind of have to sample um, consistently, you know, you have to have a sampling protocol for that. But um, I think just as an aside, maybe if people are interested, we can start pursuing that a little bit more actively because this conversation keeps coming up, so. Well, I, I, I do offer my services and, and my equipment to help you, of course. And I, as you know, I, I do, I have recently uh, founded my own business to, to move these projects forward. So I could do that outside of my, outside of my main uh, job. I still keep my position with AECOM, but I do these projects as, uh, as a small woman owned business. And I could uh, certainly assist you, Amy, with that if that want, if you wanted that to move forward in a in a non let's say a non acom capacity. I'm happy to help with that. I think we that you're absolutely correct, and this is to the chair. I'm sorry that we need to be very careful because you know we're there's to be looking at consistent habitat in Witchmere Harbor. Um, it's, it's a, a different kind of place, and there's uh, there's a giant outfall pipe. Well, I wouldn't say giant, but there's a big, large outfall pipe. So you know, we want to be able to consistently sample and, and compare apples to oranges. It would take some. It would take us putting our heads together and, and thinking about the proper way to to look at post pier potential shellfish habitat and um, but I think going back to Dr. Lino's the applicants project here again I there's there's really no difference in what we found here as what was uh, has been permitted in for other projects in the past and and again I think that that through mit mitigation the shellfish that we did find if that shellfish if some of the shellfish were dredged then that could be replaced with mitigation in orders of magnitude more than what's there okay how, how should we proceed um would you folks like a continuance uh, I know that it, it, um, we have not, most of us have not reviewed the new shellfish survey. I think I should see it too. This is Roger speaking. Uh, yes, we would like to continue the hearing. Uh, you like two weeks or a month? Um, Pam, what is your opinion? Uh, to, uh, uh, I default to Glenn. I'll I'll accommodate your schedule. Our next meeting is August nineteenth. Um, really would prefer to have any changes to the plans a week ahead of time, and then the, after that, the next meeting would be September second. Well, I am not going anywhere. I don't think any of us are going anywhere. It's just a matter of how fast you think you can, you know, talk, get comments from Heinz at least again, um, and then make any of the proposed changes, you know, height or whatever changes we've made, we might have suggested to you. Uh, yeah, we, this is Roger again. We would like to continue for a month, please. A month, so that would be September 2nd? Yes, yes. Okay. 
Okay. Well, then I, I move that we continue the hearing until September 2nd. Can I have a I'll second, please? I'll, I'll second. Say aye. Thank you. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, motion carries. Very good discussion. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is, is that's it, right, Amy? We're done. No. Uh, we have another hearing. I know. I know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the next notice of intent is for sec seven Sketchicon at Way Map Four Parcel C One Dash Four Proposed Pier Ramp and Float. <sighs> If again, this is Roger McNevich at Coastal Engineering representing the owners on this proposal. And uh, what a difference a day makes uh, comparing this site to the Anino site is like day and night. Um, this project can easily meet the length and depth of water and uh, setback criteria uh, by uh, all the state and uh, federal regulations. Uh, if you look on the plan, you can see, especially the profile, because this site is located on the out, outward side of an oxbow change in direction of the river. And if you look at the upper right-hand corner in the key map, you see that the, the, the river actually radically changes direction. And as you know, uh, flows on the outside of the Oxbow uh, greatly uh, higher uh, velocity than on the inside. Consequently, here you can see on the profile there's a very deep scour um, uh, just just uh, just beyond the proposed location of the float. And I had opportunity to visit this site with John Rendon uh, before our presentation to the Waterways Committee, uh, and we had originally had this. Uh, here extend a little bit further than it exists. We had a 20-foot long fixed pier, and with his comments, we we shortened it to only 14 feet, and we still maintain a full three feet of water at Nemo Water on the inboard side of the float. This uh, is a very short pier, um, and cognizant of the, the flows. I don't know if you had an opportunity to be out there to see when the rivers flowing on an outboard tide, um, the two white pipes that we put in to represent the outer two corners of the slope, they, they lean over to the point that they've actually pushed under the water surface. So the velocity is is quite robust. Uh, uh, this, this, this design is, is made to accommodate for that. If you notice, the, the two piles that uh, will maintain the float in its fixed location are proposed to be quite long, very well embedded uh, in, in the river bottom. The, the pier structure is uh, a traditional, quite quite short. I know uh, in relation to the comments by Amy, we're showing a five foot minimum height above the, the uh, mean, mean high water. And we, we can raise that on the plan to uh, get the six feet as, as mentioned in the last hearing. The resource areas uh, consist of uh, land sub coastal stone flowage, coastal beach, coastal bank, land under the ocean, land containing shellfish. And if you had an opportunity to look at Pam's shellfish report for this site, uh, there's, at least to the extent of her study, there's very few uh, shellfish. If you notice uh, in her shellfish report, she encountered in all of the uh, uh, location uh, study, location transects, there were two oysters uh, and they were in a location uh, north of the proposed location of the fixed pier. Uh, we view this to be a relatively uh, straightforward uh, proposal. Um, the, the structure will uh, span over the, the top of the coastal bank as shown on the plan. Uh, there is no shellfish in the area. There's no eelgrass. It's really not a suitable habitat for eelgrass. The velocities are, are so large in this area. Um, uh, we're, we're located uh, 51 feet from the uh, existing salt marsh located at, at, uh, south of the site. Um, that's pretty much it as far as our presentation. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, Amy, do you have any comments for us on this one? Yep, I do. Um, this one is very different. And actually, Roger, for this one in particular, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you had to do six feet because the primary reason I was saying that um, was because the other one was over salt marsh and here okay. the location of i mean it's up to to you and the commissioners um no, but the five feet. Yes, thanks. yeah i mean that's i mean the commission can decide help decide that but um the primary reason for elevating you know six feet off other ones is to be above above salt marsh and here you have not marsh but not where the dock is and not immediately adjacent it's you know 25 50 plus feet away. So is that a bend in the river when the, where um, the water really moves pretty quick? Um, we were there today at an incoming high, at almost a high tide, so it was hard to see, but I have been there at an outgoing. Um, the first time I visited the site was an outgoing and it does um, move very quickly there, um, which speaks to why it's so deep, probably speaks to why in your grid of samples, you didn't find too much. You found two oysters. Um, Pam, maybe you can elaborate a little bit more when I'm finished about you know, basically why um, it wasn't a complete sampling um, because essentially of depth of the river. But if you have anything more, you can add to that. Um, actually, some of my concerns have a little bit less to do with the dock itself than they do with um, the path and the coastal bank and the potential for additional erosion to the coastal bank, either as a result of um, scour because of pilings that are really just right, right at mean high water um, at the toe of the bank. Um, so a lot of my comments, um, a lot of my questions really have to do with bank stability, erosion, uh, um, additional erosion because of the velocity of the river um, at this spot, um, you know, you don't have salt marsh to defray any of the energy. Um, and then actually the path, I was thinking about this afterwards, the path meanders really close to the top of the coastal bank in places. And this is almost an afterthought and hopefully something that we can, if this does, um, event get approved that we can chat about after, um, is moving the path a little bit more inland. Um, and again, it's a very informal path to begin with there. And I think it could continue to be just a kind of meandering through the trees. But most of uh, my concerns are actually to the stability of the bank. Um, given a new structure at the spot in the river, um, you have adequate depth. It got approved by waterways as well as John and Pints. Um, it's well under our requirement for length. Um, I would say that this is a possibility of a site where um, shellfish, you know, if you were to add shellfish to the Herring River, this could offset this one. This is a pretty small proposal um, and only a couple of oysters were located, but um, Pam, maybe if you just want to talk about the um, issues you had with sampling in some of the locations here. And then after that, I am all set for now. Uh, sure, I, I wasn't necessarily asked to stay on for this case by uh, CEC and I just want to put that out there. I'm here because it's my survey and I want to answer questions if I can. Uh, the site is extremely deep and swift. And so our clam rake is, we have a large expandable clam rake that uh, extends out to 15 feet. And there are places in this location that sh per Rogers map, it's, it's as deep as 20 feet, uh, 19 to 20 feet, depending on the tide. So we just could not get there with our break. And from the shellfish perspective, the you know, it, it's to look at the shellfish relative to the depth of the water in this, you know, this more than sufficient depth between the, the boat that would be placed at this, at the, at the float and in the bottom of the seafloor where shellfish might be, although we didn't find uh, many where we could sample. This habitat is, 
as Roger said, it's a completely different location. It's, it's very deep and would support, there's more than enough water depth to meet the requirements and regulations here to, to support uh, the construction of a pier here. Thank you, Pam. Um, all right. Thank you. I guess we'll go through the comments. I will say, I guess I should ask you right up front, Pam. I, I did find some soft shell clams this morning when I was down there at low tide. Mm -hmm. So did, did you sample up the coastal beach a little bit or did you sample and not find any? I would have to bring up my map. You know, again, I'm not here necessarily to represent this client. I'm just listening in to help answer questions. I don't have my survey, honestly. I wasn't not exactly prepared to. Um, okay. I don't have have it, but I we we did the same exact footprint as we do uh, the same protocol where we set a center line and then we do every ten feet from that center line out to fifty feet um, in either direction and then ten feet um, perpendicular to the shore out to twenty feet where uh, where the float the seawardmost extent of the float and. In some cases, the same, we couldn't get a sample because the water depth was just much too deep. And right. in, 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 in part of the reason why we're sampling is to identify the shellfish habitat, but also to get a better sense of, of whether or not this site would be suitable for, for dock and pier, and, the, and it certainly would be because of the water depth in and of itself. Would protect, oh, yeah. you know. The, and we're, we're bringing up the, the map. We're bringing up the map on the screen. Sure, sure. This is the shellfish map. Can you see it? Yes. You see the two oysters. We in the areas where we have the blue dots is where we sample, Brad. Okay, so at low tide. Um, it's hard to say. I guess I gotta look at it a little bit closer. But yeah, there there, there are soft shell clams, and I think that's uh, one of those things. I think the commissioners should be aware of that that species is, is there. Um, it's their habitat. The densities are not particularly high, but the survey did miss that species. And see what time of year the survey was done too, because as you know, soft shells like to dig down in the winter um, months. So um, we could check that out. But as you said, it doesn't seem to be a, a whole lot, but you did find them. And to, to, the, to the chair, and the soft shell clams would be in the near shore, not where the boat would be placed. And there's more than sufficient water depth to support this project without well, impact. I, I, I guess the concern would be the scouring from the pilings, um, alteration to the coastal beach where the soft shell clams are. I uh, let's, get, let's, let's get on with comments and questions from the commissioners. Stan, do you have any? Yeah, I was concerned like Amy about the potential erosion of the bank um, from two respects. One is, could the pier create more of a problem with erosion than what's already there? And long term, if erosion continues, are we going to have to keep having to have them come up in front of us to do work on that pier if the bank starts washing away where the pier is, is on the bank? And that's basically my two concerns. Thank you, Stan. John? Yeah, uh, I don't I don't really have any comments, so I'm not going to uh, try not to be a broken record and uh, go on about shellfish modeling. So I don't I don't have any other concerns to talk about right now. Okay, Carolyn. Um I, I, to your point, Brad, I think the width of the dock going out will 
um, you know, you it is small enough that in that area, the soft shell clams maybe could be pushed aside a little bit and moved out. Um, but I, the erosion concern um, is there and we hate to see projects come back to us saying, okay, we need more and we need more and we need more. So the erosion concern, I, I'd like to see a little bit, uh, some kind of a plan to prevent it. All right, thank you. Uh, Ernie. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any comments. I'm not sure how you can fight a river with erosion. <laughs> no, it's, uh, That's point. It's gonna not be without gonna putting be. infrastructure and that you wouldn't want. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's uh, on, on the surface is, as Roger said, this is night and day compared to the last project we just discussed and survey was um, much more telling than the last one as well. Um, plus with the, with the water depth. I, I, what, what effect, if the, if the current is as strong as it is in this particular place, will that promote scouring for the uh, piers that are in the deeper water? Yes. Significant? I mean, I, is that something we no. should be concerned about? I would be more concerned about the more landward pilings than the one in the water. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think Stan's comments were really valid. This this site is going to need, somebody's going to want to armor this site at some point. Um, tremendous erosional forces on that, that coastal bank, given the bend. So I, I, I think it's, you know, it's a different project. It has different concerns. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this yeah. is Rod. May I speak? Sure. Um, we did look at the scour for protection for that bank, and it, based on my description, uh, it's highly susceptible to continued erosion, and that site is not eligible for any kind of engineered structure. It's just under the Portland Protection Act. So that leaves us with a soft solution, and this site is really not amenable to protection by any riverbank with the velocities flowing to any kind of soft solution, which is coconut fiber rolls. Or, uh, it, it's a dilemma, it, it, and it's our opinion that the placement of the piles uh, is really going to, the, the effect is going to be de minimis compared to the, the huge erosional energy forces of the river itself, uh, especially in a, st a storm situation. Uh, the, the erosion is going to continue uh, irrespective of uh, a few piles being put in at the toe of the coastal bank, in our opinion, in our engineering opinion. And we've set this up so that, in fact, if that does occur, we put relatively light duty foundation for the, for the little platform uh, that's uh, set back from the coastal bank. Those are diamond piers uh, that uh, can be. Uh, easily removed and it, at some point in the future uh, the pier needs to be extended landward uh, this design is set up to uh, perhaps drive piles uh, uh, further inland even uh, in the upland area with the in, with the anticipation that uh, that the scour will continue with something that could be monitored it, it is a difficult location as far as its location and uh, the river flows there and the scour effects on the embankment. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, I, there's I think situations similar to this where, I, it, you know, the, the, it's just a persistent issue and um, landowners, every time a storm comes through, it destroys the dock and landowners just have to go build it up again. So if that's, you know, if he's, if they're determined to have a dock in this location, I think if they're willing to, to go through that exercise on a regular basis, then um, you know, so be it. Excuse me, Brad. Yes. I have a question on that. Um, it's one thing where we have docks that deteriorate over time and they're rebuilt, but we're talking potentially, they'd have to come before us every time, right? 
If the location of the pier and the structure changed, yes, they would have to come in front of us. And that's what I was talking about earlier when I said, is that bank roads and they have to change the configuration of that dock from what they're presenting now. That's, that's like an ongoing fight in my opinion, or not fight, but an ongoing problem. I think, um, I think, I mean, because of the erosional forces on that river, I'm, I am wondering like how much more impact the, this would have as opposed to what's already happening there. Um, I guess I just, I don't know. Um, I would say definitely as much of this, if you permit it, that as much of the structure as possible that's below mean high water, with the exception of the pilings, because you don't want to remove those every year. But if you can get the majority of like the mass of the structure out, especially during, you know, half of the year, the winter half of the year, that might help some things too. There's just less mass. Um, but anyway, maybe I'm wrong. Any other comments, Marty? No, good. Thanks, Brett. Okay. All right. Let me let me go through my list and. Um, this one it has improvements over the last one because of the depth at the float and the lack of salt marsh impacts. I still think it's a poor location for a dock because of the erosional impacts to the coastal bank and the coastal beach. And I, I think it's really a difficult location. I'm actually quite surprised that this got through waterways. I, I think that at low tide, there was a mooring. There's a mooring there. At low tide, there's not a lot of space between where this dock is going to be in the float in that morning. And so boats are going to have to navigate that sharp turn um, with really high currents at times. So I, I, I'm actually really surprised that that happened. And, um, and I, don't, I don't really favor this location because I think that you've got an uncommon coastal beach in the Herring River. There's only like three or four of them like this. And I think that the structures will impact that. And I think... The, the structures will exacerbate the erosion that's occurring. So um, I, I have problems for those reasons. And also for shellfish, I think that, you know, the fall property downstream to me, there was some pre-survey removal of oysters. And, you know, I'm not saying it was a survey at all. I don't believe it was a survey, but uh, somebody with some interest in the project did that. And it may have happened at this site as well. I was up at this site in November, December, and, um, it's really hard to believe there were only two oysters with what I saw early in the winter. If you go down 75 feet from the site, there's oysters all over the place. So, you know, it sounds like it's not shellfish habitat, but it, it, it is. And it also has soft shell clams. So um, take away the water depth, take away the salt marsh impacts. I still am very concerned about impacts to shellfish habitat, coastal beach, coastal bank. Any comments from the audience? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. I, I just have one question, which is if there is a concern about um, frequent storm damage, would it be possible to condition that any repairs require review by the conservation commission i think that's a given right amy yeah we could always clarify that if this were to go forward though um i forgot to mention one thing if you're all done john Good. i'm done Thank you. um the dm i forgot to mention the dmf letter said um that no eelgrass, um, well, this area previously was mapped for eelgrass, but that was in the late 90s, um, potentially up to 2001. I don't know if Pam is still on the on the line. I was curious where you had a more recent map because on the Mass, uh, the Morris website for the state, um, I couldn't find anything more recent than 01. And um, 
you said in your survey you didn't find any, but the survey was done in November. Uh, the eel grass is the best time to find it is pretty much in the summer months. So it is, it's a suggestion from DMF um, to have a new eelgrass survey um, or to have a survey done between June and September. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's up to you if you want to have them do that. And if Pam's still on, I'd love to hear where you got the newer map because I didn't find it. We obtained, again, I don't, this up to this, this teaches me for staying on the phone, um, curiosity. Um, the, if I remember correctly, our, our maps come from the Oliver website or the DEP website that does an, an interactive mapping. Yep. Uh, and so I mean. it may be that the, that the data is from 2000 and one, but the we as access we access the site. Um, you know, we we like to put the type, the data which we access the site or access the site because sometimes that comes into question as DEP can update things without notifying anyone. So um, I would have to look at the data in and of itself. I agree with you that the state does prefer to do eelgrass assessments. A mass DMF does like their eelgrass assessments between um, June and September, as that's the peak growing season. That said, if eelgrass was was present, we, I, I feel confident we would have seen it because it doesn't completely disappear. I've done surveys on Nantucket and in Falmouth and on the vineyard in the winter in February and have seen eelgrass growing. Now it, it may not be at its peak height, but you still see the root system that is present where the eelgrass will come back. But I think that if we wanted to go back to, you know, if that's a condition that you would want to put in that a follow-up survey would be done for eelgrass prior to um, approval of this, you know, or uh, as a condition to approval of this stock, then uh, we, Roger could go back to the client or the applicant. And um, I'm sure that they would not have an issue with a follow-up survey. Yes, we, we agree. This is Roger. Yes, definitely. In fact, it, it maybe perhaps this could be a case where we could look for shellfish again. That why if we're going to come back for eelgrass, we could look for shellfish again. If that that could be a condition. Amy, do you see anything that we need to ask for more information that would lead to a continuance, or do you think we have everything we need? It's up to you if you want that eelgrass survey, a formal eelgrass survey. Um, or if you think you have enough doubt that you want another look at the shellfish. Um, well, I, yeah, see, I, I'm pretty firm that it's, it, it's shellfish habitat that should be protected by our bylaws. So I, I'm okay with that. Um, and eelgrass, I, I'm not sure that it should be there. So did the DM, I haven't seen the DMF letter. Did they ask for a survey or they recommended it? They, what DMF usually does is they recommend um, a survey. Let me look at the letter. Hold on. Uh, da, 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 da. DMF letter for sketchy comment. It says, and given that eelgrass beds have been mapped previously in this region, and again, the maps that I saw on DP's website were from like 1995 and 2001, so 20 years ago. Um, and actually in 2001, the eelgrass was more towards the western side of the river um, and not where this property is. 
but the yieldgrass survey should be performed to demonstrate absence of yieldgrass within the peer footprint. So it doesn't say it has to be, it says it should. Right. Um, hey, so you Carol, would, yeah. Here's the yieldgrass mapping project viewer from SDEP on the screen. Okay. Says, uh, 1995. 1995. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Right. So if you could, could you use your um, cursor? Yeah, or the 2006, we don't see it anymore. If you can scroll across again. See that right. Okay. And go to well, different than what I saw. That's interesting um, because I'll. Um, Mass Coastal Zone Management, they have a similar system to Oliver. They, it's called Morris. And theirs, you would think, would be more up to date because it's Coastal Zone Management, but DEP's is more updated. DEP's so, is more updated. Morris is, is a retired system. All right. Good to know. Um, okay. So it is. it was previously mapped, but is it mapped now? Um, if... The survey didn't show any remnants. Brad, if you think um, this is not the ideal site for it, then it, it's, I'm okay with it. Yeah, I've, I've dove in the channel there a few times, scuba diving, and um, I haven't seen any eelgrass there recently. It um, yeah. On the far bank, it's very shallow, not, that, not even that far over. It gets shallow quickly. And there may be some eelgrass there, but... Um, you know, the water is often so turbid, I, I can't see eelgrass doing that well. In this site. Gotcha. That location. Um, Brad, you're the chair. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm not comfortable making our decision without a second shellfish survey. You have your very strong, very educated opinion, but we have the professional survey that that our regs request require that says something else so i i think that should be resolved before we make any permanent decisions um well it's um you know the, the survey missed soft shell clams and that that's a concern it's happened before and um it, it, I'm concerned about that issue. I think the cohogs there are much deeper. And so, if, you know, it's hard to get them with a normal size rate, but if you go down the slope, there'll be cohogs. So that I feel that if there are cohogs present there that might not be impacted by, you know, erosional forces. You know, whether, you know, they're affected by pollution and boats cause pollution. So, I mean, that's another issue that I'm concerned about as well. But, um, and then the oysters, you know, kind of mystifying that there were so few to me at, at that stretch. Um, so I don't know if we ask for another survey or we, we take time to review the survey and continue um, and have people review the survey again. Um, I guess that's up, up to everybody what you want to do here. Um, you know, we, we don't have density criteria. If shellfish are present, um, you know, we're not supposed to allow new structures without a variance. According to the professional document, though, there are two shellfish that were found. I know, and I, I'm raising concerns with that. And it's, it, it's not so much to do with the execution of the survey, um, except for the soft shell clams. You know, I, we, you, know, uh, you know, through the chair, we, I, you know, we find shellfish. It's not like we, you know, I do my surveys and they consistently come up with no shellfish. It, as you saw from the last survey, we find shellfish. And, and so it's our job to look at them. The survey was, you know, there's no specifications on the time of year that surveys can be done. It's... It, it, it is what we found and and that's what was there now that said again part uh, in my opinion the the impact from 
from docks and piers comes from, as Brad said, the boat. And the boat it often is a concern, as we heard in the last case, that it, there's not enough water depth. And that causes impact to the sediment from scouring. This site happens to be very deep and has, I mean, of, of the places where you would want to put a pier, uh, aside from take, from the shellfish perspective, this is a, a, a viable place to put a pier because the water depth is so deep, you would not have the impact uh, from the scouring of the vessel. And, you know, you've got up to 20 feet here. So in, in my opinion, I think from the shellfish opinion anyway, the, it's not significant habitat and you have the water depth. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I believe that's what you found and that's what was there when you did your survey. I, I totally accept that, um, you know, but um, it's tough. Our, our bylaws are pretty clear to me and, uh, you know, the, the float may not impact habitat, but the boat could as well as the pilings. And then there are impacts to the coastal beach and the coastal bank that I, I think are pretty significant with it's i just you put a structure there it's going to exacerbate the erosional factors that are occurring right now mr chairman this is roger yeah i speak mm -hmm. yeah. i think yeah. we i think with what we're hearing uh on, on behalf of the client we probably want to continue this hearing until uh september 2nd if we might okay allow us time to sort out uh, uh, our, our options and uh, review the information uh, related tonight and uh, decide uh, to what extent uh, uh, in availability of Pam to do additional uh, survey at the site if, if uh, necessary shellfish survey yep that, I think that's fine I um I, I, are we requesting other survey uh oh the folks want to just review the existing one i mean how do you want to handle that just to throw it out there um pam is i mean completely qualified but you you do also have the option of a third party review mm -hmm. so just to let you know that yeah for sure i i am certainly uh open to a third party, uh, uh, you know, a round table discussion, comparison of my res of our results at that time when they were collected to a study that's done at whether it's similar or different times of the year. I'm happy to discuss or or not or take it independent and, and sit back and see whatever whatever makes the most sense. I'm completely willing to work with the town. Yeah. Pam, I wasn't, nothing negative against you. I just was letting them know their options. Oh yeah, yeah. no, no, I know Amy. Oh, I totally, and I know there's other options too. So um, I'm totally open to other, uh, what I'm saying is, is I'm totally open to that. Happy to work with or, you know, with you on that. I, you know, Mr. Chairman, I think given our ongoing focus on shellfish and, and the concerns that we have for them, having a second survey, if, if the uh, applicant is amenable to it, I, I think we should request that. Okay. I think it is, can that be done in time for September 2nd or um, is, we, we, is that enough time, I guess, for the, the applicant? I guess it's usually the shellfish surveys are done in conjunction with Pam and we uh, coastal uses our boat to provide boat uh, access for Pam. So it's up to, uh, I'd have to coordinate with Pam just on her schedule. But do uh, you, you have a feel for that, Pam, at this point? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, I, I can most certainly find a day, I think, where we could do the shellfish survey again. But again, Roger, I, I also, if the town wants to, have a third party if they want you to hire somebody else to look at the shellfish at this location, then I, you know, wholly support that as well. I want to do what's best for the town and what's best for the applicant and work collaboratively across the board here. 
um, by by no means do I want to hog all the cohogs. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about if we continue to the second, and then maybe we provide you with some comments really quickly on okay. things we might want to see. Um, okay. I don't want you to change your, your methodology, but there, there may be um, some comments that I can come up with. Um, they might, I, you know, just explain why the, the soft shells were missed. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I welcome those comments, Brad. For sure. Okay. And right, I would then, actually so you, recommend that you do stay um, with the same surveyor. That way, the methodology is consistent. Um, I just mentioned the other thing, so you know your options. But I think in this case, it's it would be good to have the same person or firm do the survey. Mm -hmm. oh. Yep. I, I would say hitting low tide is pretty important for that site. I'm sure you target low tide. Oh yeah, we target well, especially a site like this. We try to Brad, we target a low tide at noon. We try to find a day when we have a minus tide, and the tide is at the middle of the day, so we can get there yep. and work the following tide. Because, as you all know, the tide floods faster than it ebbs. Yep. Okay, well then, uh, if there's no further comments, then I, I move that we continue to September 2nd. Okay, and I'll look with Roger. Okay. In the, in the applicant. Very good. Well, second. thank you very much. Uh, well, let's, let me, can I have a second, please? Second. Sure. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we'll see you on the second. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, can we skip over the orders of conditions and get to the certs of compliance and the sure. discussion of 422 Maine, just because I know we have people on the line for those? Absolutely. So can we do the request for certificate of compliance for Peter and Valerie McNeely at 12 Mill Road? Okay. Do you want me to announce it? Um, sure. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, next we have a request for certificate of compliance at 12 Mill Road, Map 8, parcel T4, after the fact filing to replant area that was clear cut without a permit. All right, so I think um, their representative Ben Layton is on the phone as well as potentially one of the owners. Um, I'll just quickly give you um, a summation of how we got here. So this was an after the fact filing to replant an area that was clear cut without a permit. Um, this is right as your summary that I wrote, but in 2015, um, the area was cut without a permit and um, the commission required them to file an after the fact notice of intent. And that's what this um, is for, the request for cert of that um, area. They got a replanting plan. Um, the, the first attempt kind of didn't, didn't work so well. So they have a, um, Mr. Layton is now their contractor. Last year that you gave them a one year extension. Um, the plants were planted under my guidance um, in the fall of 2019 and made sure that um, what was supposed to go in, you know, and talked about placement and groupings and stuff like that. Um, I visited the site late this spring with uh, Mr. Layton and the plants were really taking well. Um, under my advice, he installed some chicken wire around the area to keep the bunnies out and this um, did, did help out. Um, at this time, I would recommend that you issue a certificate of compliance with ongoing conditions to let them leave the chicken wire up for another year or so. Another um, to also let them keep the drip irrigation in for another year because this is a really harsh site. Um, and that you just, um, we follow up with a letter with a certificate of compliance that, you know, just emphasizes that any future work within the 100 foot buffer to the wetland goes for approval by the Conservation Commission. Um, and with that, if um, either Mr. Layton or the owners want to say anything, I think they're on the, on the line. I think you summed it up, Amy. That, that's exactly what I would have said. That's Mr. Layton. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Peter McNeely, the owner. And um, the uh, uh, Ben did a terrific job here, I think, on replanning. And the first replanting wasn't done properly. And 
the proper amount of fertilizer and, and, and watering and all, but we've overcome all that. And um, if we don't have a harsh winter with a lot of salt, I think it'll probably take hold now. And um, thank you for all your help, Amy. And and um, and uh, after three years or so, or what is, is it almost four years, to finally be able to get this cleared up. Thank you. Okay, um, any questions from the commissioners? Let me uh, flip it around and start with Ernie. No, I have no questions. Okay, Carolyn? No questions. Yep, John? No questions. All right, and Stan? Uh, no questions, it's unanimous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> All right, so Amy, you'll need from us a, a uh, vote accepting the cert. Yep, that you grant the certificate of compliance. Okay, well, I, I move that we grant the certificate of compliance for 12 Mill Road, map eight, parcel T4. I second it. Seconded by Stan, all those in favor say aye. Aye, oh, wait, Brad. All right, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I think Amy wanted the ongoing conditions to let them leave the chicken wire up for another year and keep the drip irrigation in for another year. I'll put that in a cover letter. Okay. Okay. You don't really condition certs, right? No, you can put ongoing conditions on the certs. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, with that modification, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion no. carried. Go ahead, sorry. Yep, um, unanimously. Uh, just so the owners and um, Ben know, we will follow up with the actual paperwork for the certificate of compliance. Um, you'll get that in the mail in the next week or so. Um, and who do you want? The, the original of it is going to have to go to the Registry of Deeds. Um, that way the permit, everything comes off of your deed. So whoever wants the original, um, let me know where you want me to send the original to make sure it can get brought to the registry. I'll touch base with you in the morning, Amy, and uh, okay. we'll get it worked out. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Amy, do you want to do 18 Harbor Way next? Sorry, didn't realize I wasn't on. I have um, some animals who it's, they're getting a little upset. <laughs> with I, me right now. Um, I can't, I don't know if there's anybody on here for 18 Harbor Way. If there is, can you speak up or uh, we'll go to the next topic. Okay, um, since they're not on, um, can we come back to that, Brad? And can we do sure. the replanting plan for 422 Main Street? Well, I'm just going to step away for a second and let the dog out. Sure. You can go ahead without me for one minute. I think Mr. Burgess, the representative, is is on the line, and I'll chime in in just a moment. Okay. Would you like to give us a summary, Mr. Burgess? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, for the record, Mark Burgess uh, representing Mr. Barber at 422 Main Street. Uh, first thing I want to say is the delay in getting this to you is is pretty much entirely my fault. Um, I got the plan from uh, J.M. O'Reilly uh, oh, probably months ago at this point. Um, but just because of my workload, I just haven't been able to get to it. So I scratched out this quick uh, sketch plan. Um, Amy and I and the, and the uh, applicant met on site. 
to go over where and what certain plants would come by, would, you know, that could be planted here. Um, I got this to Amy last night, which means she got it this morning. That's how last minute this is. So I do apologize for that, uh, sincerely. Um, I'm just overwhelmed. So at any rate, uh, so using her suggestions, I came up with this plan. You can see the, the various areas and what she recommended us to plant there. Um, these are all based on an email that she was very nice to uh, supplement and send to us with her recommendations. So we're just basically following her recommendations. Um, obviously, when she gets back from letting the dogs out, um, we should get her input and see if I did a, a satisfactory job on the plan itself. Um, and the applicant was there during this uh, on-site. We also, you know, another part of this was the work that was done in the backyard, which was um, about this retaining wall. And, and he, the, he was replacing this retaining wall. But there's some other hardscape work that he wants to do close to the house, outside of the 50, um, nearly at the 100. Mm -hmm. But what we agreed is, to get the planting approved and get going on that, we were going to do this through the through the violation and file a separate notice for the remaining site work. Did you get all that, Amy? I got it. I have it uh, pretty loud in here, and I could hear it. Okay. I'm very sorry about that. I have critters that needed immediate attention. Otherwise, they would have interrupted everything. <laughs> so I have to say this. We know who let the dogs out. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay so i described to the board um your help that you gave us which was awesome and uh this is a, a real quick plan that i dreamed up here based on amy's um, email and that we were going to use this avenue for the violation and then uh there'll be a whole separate notice of intent for the rest of the hardscape both the replacement wall and i guess he wants to put a uh, a, not a patio, a, a stone walkway up real close to the house. But that'll be a separate notice of intent. So for now, this is just to address the plantings. So Amy, how, uh, how does the plan look to you? Uh, it looks like what we talked about. Good. good. That was um, the idea. Yes. So um, is that the segue into me? OK. <laughs> um, so I thought, I mean, the real pressing point right now is that this activity was done about a year ago and the real pressing point was, um, to get planting done and, and fix that. Um, and I didn't want to have to wait any longer for any work about, you know, engineering work on the wall or the rest of the site in order to get this done. So figured let's get the planting plan complete so they can do that this fall. I was um, really happy to see that when I went to the site um, a few weeks ago, that really nothing, you know, we said nothing should be touched, period. And they really didn't touch anything. There even was, you know, tons of weeds growing up the foundation of the house because they were afraid to weed whack those. <laughs> um, so because of that, um, you went out to the site, a couple of you went out with me today, um, and a couple hopefully went on your own, you saw that things were coming back really well. Um, so instead of what could have been a really huge replanting effort, it's not going to be as big. Um, what the plan shows may be smaller than what you originally thought it was going to be. And that's because in my opinion, I think what's growing there now is very natural. You don't have a lot of invasives coming in. Um, you have sweet pepper bush that's coming back well, bearberry, bayberry, sweet fern. You have all these good things and trees. Actually, you have an oak tree and a couple of cherry trees that are coming in. And instead of um, altering that, I think the best strategy is to plant around that. And that leads to what we kind of have here um, in front of you. And um, a couple of trees had come down supposedly during the tornado that they had removed. I think there were like three or four. 
Um, so I did um, suggest a couple of uh, understory trees because you have a lot of canopy abutting the area with a lot of huge oaks and um, pitch pines. But you don't really have that understory layer and Shadbush Service Berry does provide that as well as it's a great plant for habitat. So I've suggested at least three of those um, and they'll show up on the plan um, towards the northeast property side. And then the rest of the area is going to, um, in addition to what's already growing there, would be a mix of kind of what's already there already. Sheep laurel, um, sweet pepper bush, bayberry, sweet fern, things like that, with a buffer of um, wildflowers. And that would all, uh, right at the 50 foot line, um, to is kind of an open area and that would provide good pollinator and other types of habitat for birds and things like that. So this fully reestablishes the 50 foot no disturb zone. Um, the owner did show me pictures, you know, back in the seventies where there essentially was really not much here. And I did explain that, you know, things naturalized over time. And because they did that, you know, everything was protected. So, um, they seem to be okay with that. And um, I would say, I think in, in my, I think we should get moving, um, allow them to get moving on the replanting plan and then come back to us for um, the work that was being done on the wall, which has stopped and any additional hardscape up closer to the house. I, I did tell them, you know, they're not going to be able to have, you know, your traditional very manicured lawn within the 100 foot buffer any lawn area you have to have is um, natural and this plan doesn't necessarily mean that anything landward of 50 feet is automatically lawn area this is just really to take care of the place of the area that was hit the hardest with the um the activity that took place illegally so there may be more plantings that you see coming next in the next uh in the notice of intent but um yeah hope you uh hope you like it i have a question yeah. the notes the notes that are on the plan are they do they cover everything the way you want it do they a, a little closer and we can make those little changes about spacing um yeah i took that i took the spacings off of your list except there was one plant one plant that isn't in on your list but it was on the barnstable county list what's that um i can't remember now <laughs> well where your plan went i have it here might have been the sheep moral. I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't want to take the time. Um, to definitely is native, but anyway, um, everything is native that's on your plan. So I, I just note one was about all plants being from the list. Um, note note two was more to your point. All the plants should be just installed in the in the remaining bare areas. So the areas that I show on the plan are quite large, but the actual amount of plants that are going to go in there is going to be much less than a full coverage of that area. Um, excessive mulch and debris can be removed. I talk about, and then I talk about each plantings. Um, and then other plants may be used with approval from the agent. Plants should be watered with surface irrigation for the first growing first few growing seasons, after which the irrigation can be removed, and plants which do not survive shall be replaced. To obtain a 90% success rate, I guessed at that. That's typically what we require. And instead of first few growing seasons, I would just make it very definitive and say two years instead of a first few growing seasons, because a few is arbitrary, is kind of up for negotiation. Um, I would just say that the temporary, so it's temporary above ground irrigation would be allowed for two years after yep. planting. I always struggle with that one because you have to water the plants, especially this summer, if you want anything to survive more than one season, yet mm -hmm. irrigation can be problematic. So what do you do? Yep. I get it. Um, so what's the next step? The commissioners will get a chance to chat about your plan right now. Oh, oh, oh that. 
Yeah, that. <laughs> what time is it? Okay. Don't mind me. <laughs> All right, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. I don't see him. Is he there? Yeah, well, I see him on the phone. Brad? Sorry, I was muted for a second. Sorry about that. Um, I just said I'm fine with what you guys discussed, but I guess let's go around and see how people feel. Um, Ernie, any any thoughts or did we lose you? That's it looks like he's trying yeah. to call. Right, okay, I've got to make a call. Yeah. Let's start with Stan. Come back, Tony. We were out there today. I don't have any time. But Amy went over it, and everything looks fine. John, no comments. Yeah, Carolyn. No, nope, I trust Amy. Yep, I feel the same way. Um, Ernie might be on a different call right now. Nope, he just got off. <laughs> he could put a thumbs up. Yeah. Any any thoughts or comments I'm on back. the plan? <laughs> no, I'm I'm fine with it. I'm sorry. I got people lighting off fireworks at the town beach next door. So Lovely. My dogs are going nuts. I'll, I'll tell but my I'm boys. Fine with it, Mark. Here is. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, do we do we need to vote, Amy? Are we just good to go? Yeah. If you would please vote to approve the replanting plan for 422 Main Street, that would be great. Okay. And would you like to, if you would like to give them a deadline, I do love deadlines, um, to shoot for, for the hardscape, understanding that that's not as, we really just care about the wall, but if he wants to do more, that's, that's on them. But I mean. Can I ask a question about that? Sure. If the wall is outside the 50, does it have to be a notice or can it be an RDA for any of that work? Well, our new regulation is, I mean, 60 feet is no new structure. But if you're replacing and you, your, your argument you have to make is that it is an, an exact replacement of the wall that was there. So if it's an exact replacement of the wall that was there and is greater than 60 and or <laughs> is greater than 60 feet, um, and it would also depend on the amount of walkways and patio work you had to do. So, Mark, if you wanted to come up with a, um, you know, a draft plan and send it to me, I could tell you if it could be an NOI or an RDA. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, we can do a sketch. I don't even know what he wants yet, so we'll we'll figure that out. Um, and obviously, I don't know deadlines. <laughs> um, it, he can't do anything in the fifty to one hundred until we file for it, one way or the other. So that, right. that well, I guess it's not hugely pressing. One thing I would I would allow, I would say we should allow him to do, you know, he can definitely cut the weeds that are around his foundation. If he wanted to throw down some seed this fall that's just native Cape Cod grass seed in the bare area he has in the 50 to 100, just to help stabilize that, I, I'm fine with that. Um, so there's some exposed soil still up there, you know? Yeah, the I guess from what I'm need a deadline for that for any for the hardscape because it's really nothing can happen without a file. So, from what I'm scaling off the plan where the existing wall is, I think we measured on the field. Um, Amy, let me know if I'm was it 11 or 17 feet further the wall had to go. I don't where, remember. 11 seems more. It seems right, but. I don't remember now. Um, I think I wrote it. Actually, the only reason I say is because that tells uh, 17 feet I have, but that 17 feet would extend into the 50. If, uh, but it still is assumed to be a replacement of what was there. So does that make your decision any easier? Okay, if it's in the 50 period, it have to be a notice. But okay. commission, tell me if I'm wrong, but. Even if it's a replacement, I think work in the 50 is going to require the notice. Oh. 
But again, I'm happy to look at it. And if you guys, I mean, this is hardscape we're talking about. If they stabilize the site, I guess there's no real hurry for them to file other than the, you know, the owner wanting the hardscape done. There's no real rush on our end to make them file for it. Okay. All right, so we're really just a, approving the plan. Yeah, approve the planting plan. Yeah. Just rec yep. I just recommend that. Yep. Okay, and then it sounds like a deadline isn't really necessary. I don't think for us. Okay, well then I, I, I move that we approve the replanting plan for 422 Main Street as discussed. Can I have a second, please? I'll second it. Second by second. Carolyn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. You've got a planting, replanting plan. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, we do have um, the DACs on the line for the request for certificate of compliance for 18 Harbor Way. If you want to announce it and I'll give you a, a summary and they can add in if they want to. Super, okay. Um, next, we have a request for certificate of compliance for 18 Harbor Way, map one, Parcel C2-7, it was an upgraded septic with plantings. Yeah, um, and I'll just say a few things first, and then Gwen and David, if you wanted to chime in, you can um, you can do so in a moment. So this was a um, notice of intent for a septic upgrade and plantings. I am, we are recommending, Nikki and I, issuance of a certificate of compliance. Um, if you also recall, we had to, um, there was additional plantings that went in and driveway footprint that got um, altered and then reduced and more plantings were put in. They, um, they put in the plantings, the first kind of go around, they had a really hard time establishing the plantings. It's a really just hot, dry, windy site. So they have done some, um, the plantings are looking pretty good now. They did look pretty dry the other day, um, but we we are recommending the sort of compliance provided that they replant the native plants that don't make it. Just that side is really difficult. Um, but they have made they made good effort twice, and the plants that are in there now are are do, are growing. So, and if uh, it's up to you, Mr. Chair, but Gwen and David Dax are on the on the call. Okay. Um, Hi, it, it good sounds can you hear me? Forward. Yep. Yep. Go ahead, please. I just want to make sure you hear us. Yeah, that you yes. Technology. Well well we appreciate the assistance from everyone and from Amy and Nikki. Um, and it's been very hot, so we've been trying to hand water. Uh, not to disturb the flowering, but they seem to be, you know, with this hot summer. They, they survived. They survived. And, uh, we were hoping that, I mean, most of them survived, grew to the size that we were hoping. There was two of them that have to be more nurtured, and uh, we saw the two rabbits like uh, one type of the, you know, the planting, so we tried to find a solution for them. But, yeah, that they're but, nibbling on the, the leaves. But overall, yeah, the, the area, you know, is uh, uh, growing the way we, we were hoping. And it's a difficult area because we have to, uh, you know, use the drip hoses and we put them there. Now we remove them a little bit because we're here and we watering them every day. Um, then we'll put them again when, uh, when we'll be a way for them to keep getting uh, enough irrigation. I would recommend okay. that you can, um, if you wanted to, you can put some chicken wire around those plantings that you notice the rabbits really like. Um, it actually, it, it just can get it at Agway, it's just basic, you know, garden chicken wire, and it does help the plants so that they can establish themselves for a year or two. Um, and then you can take it away and usually they can handle a little bit of nibbling after that. But when they're young, they have a hard time with the bunnies, so. Definitely do it. All right, well, um, I guess I'll just ask if anyone has comments. I, I think it's all pretty straightforward. Any comments from any of the commissioners? 
Okay. Um, seeing none, I guess I'll ask for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the upgraded septic and plantings at 18 Harbor Way. Have a second, please. A second. Seconded by Stan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for hanging in there tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you also for your help. Thank you, Amy. Good night. Thank you, Amy. Good night. Good night. Uh, All right, Amy, what, what do you want to tackle next? Uh, before I forget about it, can we quickly do the order of conditions for Kathy Green at 2261 Head of the Bay? And sure. then we can jump into the Bell's Neck Bogs if you want. I know there's a couple people on for that. Okay. I don't, right. want, to forget. I don't want to forget the orders. So let me know if you have any comments on the orders for 2261 Head of the Bay. No, I went through them, Amy. I had no comments on I had no comments either. No comments. I have no comments. Oh, someone want to make a motion. <laughs> yeah, if, if Carolyn has no comments, that means it's clean. <laughs> All right, it, uh, if someone would like to make a motion, we can approve this. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the order of conditions for uh, 2261 Head of the Bay Road. Have a second, please. Second. Second. All right. Seconded by John. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. All right. On to discussion. And I guess we'll start off. We've already taken care of 42 Main Street. So Bell's Neck Bog Management Plan. Um, do you want to give us a, a kind of an update as to where we are, Amy, for everybody? Uh, sure. Um, so the subcommittee, which consists of uh, members Mark, Jim, and our chairman Brad, um, met on site once or twice and um, came up with a couple of ideas. So the purpose of the discussion tonight is to really take the draft options that Mr. Chase, um, I'm sorry, Chairman Chase, <laughs> um, came up with and kind of discuss, um, well, one, I wanted to, this is just a draft document. The whole idea would be to put it into a final draft form with your comments and discussion tonight for if you wanted to see things added to it, omitted, changed, whatever, and then come up with a final draft plan that we can then take for public comment at a near future meeting. So, um, Unfortunately, the other two members of the subcommittee are not on the call tonight, but um, this is a great time for comments and suggestions on this. I added a few little things and um, that's really where, where we're kind of at. The, the point, the, the goal tonight is not to approve an option. It's to start to vet these options to come up with a a final draft op plan. Yep, I, I agree with you, Amy, entirely. I, I think it's important to let the public um, get a look at this and, and have some thoughts. And then also, I think the other two subcommittee members, we want them to be present and uh, take part in the discussion. So um, I think we can probably have an abbreviated discussion tonight. And um, so I guess let's. Um, you know, we'll, we'll go through what the commissioners have to say. We, we've got uh, Mr. Hall on the line. We want to hear from him and um, maybe just, you know, give your thoughts and realize that we, you know, we're going to have some time to um, edit this, to vet this. And then I would, I would guess, you know, maybe, I don't know, September 2nd or the, or the hearing after or, or sometime soon in the fall, we would like to have a vote on 
the preferred management approach. So um, let's see, do you want to start, Ernie? Do you have any comments on, uh, were you able to take a look at this? Yeah, I did, Brad, and it, it was really well done. I, I mean, it's nice to finally see all the discussions that we've been having over the years uh, put into a document that's, that's pretty cohesive, I think, and, and um, detailed. Uh, one question, or a couple questions for you. Under option one, the ecological restoration, it talks about um, that we've not favored that given the high cost relative to the expected benefit. Yeah, it struck me as I read that it would be helpful to know what those, what are the uh, cost drivers um, that are in this, that would apply to this option. Um, but I didn't get a sense of really what those would be and um, you know how much they would, you know, would make a statement about high cost relative to expected benefit, but there's, there's nothing to really um, substantiate that. Yeah, we could add, we could add to that. I, I think um, Amy did have discussions with the Division of Ecological Restoration for the state, and they they didn't really favor it as it was not a main stem system, I believe. And I'll, I'll let Amy follow up. But um, and also, you know, when they when they approach projects, they're, they're fully reconstructing the watershed, and so projects at the Coon Mesa River and Falmouth up at the, the Tidmarsh area in Plymouth, they're, they're multi-million dollar projects. And um, they do great things for, to restore the watershed. I, I think that for this section of the bog, I, I just don't think it's, um, you know, it's something that would produce the benefits given the high cost. But we, we could add some details. What do you think about that, Amy? So um, I did meet with DER once or twice out here and they, um, you know, they help fund, they help design and fund a lot of these restoration projects where it really deals with putting a, st a stream, if there's a stream back to its natural place, really breaking up a cranberry mat and um, which to some extent suppress some natural growth um, and just they do the complete restoration. So they can offer the town a lot of free, a lot of low cost or free services if they have a um, deem a high priority, the, the watershed is a high priority or the project is a high priority for improvement of habitat or water quality. Um, they had said that this one um, being the size that it was and being, um, they, they just didn't think that it was going to be a high priority list for them to offer a lot of technical assistance. So that would mean when it came to, if you were to look towards not just letting the bog naturalize by, you know, do whatever it's going to do as it is, but if you were to look to altering or creating streams, removing water restrictions, um, really changing um, just the whole makeup of everything out there mechanically, if you will, um, that the costs would really have to stem from the town or some other grant funding. And the, also the design, they wouldn't, they, their expertise to help design what should or what would naturally be there, um, wouldn't be, wouldn't be there, but I can definitely speak. They've said that they're willing to consult in a small fashion to kind of guide us through this because um, they do see it's valuable, but they just don't have the time to take on a small project. Um, so I can talk to them about other things about what cost factors might be and what those, uh, uh, you know, kind of costs would be just because I, I do agree with you, Ernie, that I think when you say high cost versus unknown value, I think we're going to get some comments about, well, what are those costs? What is this value? So I, I really, um, I agree with your comment and I think I could informally talk to them and see what those cost factors are. Okay. Good. Um, next question I had was, uh, this is just a real quick one on under the option two, uh, where we talk about the water flow management. Uh, so the water be allowed to flow from the West Reservoir through the bogs and the outlet pipe back out to the Herring River. 
on on the map that's accompanying this, it, it, I thought it would be helpful if we could sort of show where the inflow and the outflows are, because um, it wasn't clear necessarily, and it'd be it just for helpful, I think, as, as far as understanding. I thought about that after I sent it off. <laughs> okay. I sent it off. I We're having like here. This is good. Bye. Huh? Uh, then under the uh, same option too, at the end of it, we talked about the road gate and you're proposing spring closure from April 1st to June 1st, seven to seven each day um, to reduce illegal night activity, including river herring and the poaching. And I agree with that, but dumping and substance abuse, those aren't necessarily just nightly activities, I wouldn't think. I mean, that's, and it's not seasonal either. So I think Thank you just have to be a little careful on how we characterize some of these things. Yeah, maybe eliminate that and just call it um, illicit activity. That's you know? what, yeah, illicit activities. Yeah, but again, someone's still going to challenge you as to why it's only spring illicit activities. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's a good point, but I, I guess so many people love to use that area. Yeah. It's going to be considered a, a um, a limitation as it is it, just mm -hmm. for that spring and I, I think there's been a lot of you know a fair amount of activity with the poaching when the fish are there and but outside of that window I, I hate to restrict the public too much I agree with you Brad and, and I think the the dumping and substance abuse and all that stuff you're gonna have that in the Bells Neck area anyhow it's not just this road road gate um, Maybe area in particular I think our, our concern here should be the poaching and, yeah. and only the poaching, really. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Think of the other reasons and just leave it at that. So. Yeah. And, and yep. I was just wondering, you know, we've got that guy that lives right by the gate there. Has anybody ever talked to him if he'd be willing to do that opening and closure? Ron, the former Ron. commission member. Yeah, he's. I've, I've talked to Ron about this and, and he is he's willing. Um, but he would he would like to maybe not be the only person because in the afternoon it's a problem because you got to chase people out of there. Uh, so I think we would have to pl platoon how this happens, and so that's kind of a discussion for the commission at some point as this goes forward. Yeah. But yeah. you you might find him taking all the morning openings or five of the morning openings. He he will definitely contribute. Yeah, good good. That'd be helpful. You know, that'd help. Yeah with the, the resources we would need to get some of these things through. Uh, under option three, we talked about the cranberry growing and seasonal flooding of the eastern section of the middle bog. Um, is that all that would be needed to sustain growth of the bog? Well, you know, you can see that it's a, like a five-year plan. Yeah. And my thought is that, you know, you, you try something, you know, is there an educational component that will materialize here? You know, is there actually a project with, you know, the tech school that might show up and make it worthwhile? My thought is, if that can happen, great, but let's do it for a five-year window and see how it goes. Um, and I, I think you can have cranberries in a five-year window with that, that effort. In the long term, you probably have to do more things. Okay. So... So what you're saying here is that the uh, option three would be dependent on some sort of a partnership with a tax or somebody, some other third party, really. I think so. Right? Yeah, I, I think that to, to expect, you know, Amy's, you know, Amy's department or Heinz's department to just lead the charge here, that's a lot. And so there almost has to be some educational partnership that comes up and um so you know so i'm not sure you know we, we heard about it um in the public hearing there was some interest and uh you know i just don't i, I hate to speak for somebody else on this one but that's probably how this would happen a, a partnership would allow this to happen and but it would have to be identified and people have to step up to to want to participate then i then what i would do is rather than just mentioning the partnership down under the upland shrub growing section. I'd move that right up to the top paragraph then. Because really this whole option would be dependent on 
having some sort of partnership to provide the support for the cranberry growing and the flooding and you know managing a pick your own project and all that sort of stuff really right i that's a really good point you, you could have a pick your own concept that had very limited management so that that's possible um but i, I think you're right probably in the, the first paragraph there needs to be some discussion on you know if if these partnerships are interest you know they could be developed pick your own could be very casual i suppose but at some point you would have to make decisions on you know taking care of the bog yeah things happen i i think it's pretty interesting how you know in that eastern section closest to the reservoir there's been berries to pick for a good number of years after the last leaseholder you know left the lease you know and yeah. it's not like it's commercial quantities but it, you know you can go there and get plenty of cranberries wonderful good that's I, and like i said that's, that was the only comments i had and I, I really appreciate the work you guys put into this i think it's a great job yeah no i thank you those are good comments um let's see uh carolyn i think um uh, i think those comments were very good i read the whole thing and changed one verb um and and suggested that amy that you add the names of the members of the committee the subcommittee to the document but other than that i thought it was uh I thought it was clear and and concise and simple and worked well. Okay, thank you. All right, Stan. So, oh, I am on. Um, not much to say after Ernie and Carolyn's comments. Uh, well done, Brad. Okay, John. Yeah, I guess, uh, thanks. Thank you. Thank the three of you, even though only one of you is here for a great job summarizing the options. Seems to me that two and three are the viable ones in there. Um, and I, it's a little unclear to me how you're describing the next steps, whether we're going to winnow these things down. Um, but I also have just a question, and maybe it's um, whether whether there's any role for that property to play in the process of cleaning up the Herring River uh, watershed, and whether there's any way, whether there's any thought, and I I don't have ideas, specific ideas at all, but um whether there's any way that that whole area could be used to absorb some of the nutrients out of the herring river that are causing problems further downstream that we some of which we were discussing earlier this evening and I which is a fundamental problem for the town um and is there any way we can leverage that resource yeah it's a great it's a great comment um and John, it speaks back to, you know, Pam Newberg made a comment earlier tonight about how, you know, the town is doing a great job of improving water quality. We haven't got there yet. You know, we're, we're planning, but we haven't done anything yet, you know, really. So in, in, if you look on option two, number five, I mentioned that, but I, I, I call it potential because I don't know. I the experts tell me that wetland freshwater wetlands plants do a pretty good job attenuating nitrogen and that, that freshwater ponds do a better job than saltwater ponds. So if we're not putting fertilizer, if we're not putting, you know, treatments in this area, there may be some improvements in attenuation of nitrogen that would be, that would not be there otherwise. So I did list that as a potential benefit, but you know, it's, it's people a lot smarter than me that would know if that's really going to happen or not. But I, I think it's a good step and it's, um, you know, it's kind of a model for some of the other locations in town where they want to create fresh, freshwater wetlands, freshwater ponds to do that exact goal to attenuate nitrogen. Um, 
Thank gonna, you. I'm going to ask Mr. Hall in a second. Any follow-up comments there, Amy? Any thoughts from your perspective on these ideas, these options? Um, well, just to elaborate on or to go on to John's question, um, I originally did have a conversation with Department of Ecological Restoration about how valuable they thought um, this piece might be to doing some sort of restoration that would, the focus would be nitrogen attenuation. And um, they said um, that an area this small might be, they, they didn't know how much of an improvement this would, would, would be if we were to do, um, revert to freshwater wetlands, um, either streams or wet meadows or ponds. Um, because uh, uh, unlike, so take Cold Brook, for instance, the stream from Grassy Pond literally goes through the middle of this and then out, it's part of the river itself. But this really is kind of an offshoot. Um, so just in order to make that maybe more of a viable thing, maybe it would mean for more rerouting of and more alteration in order to get water flow to go in a certain direction. But it's certain, I mean, I can, I can ask that question a little bit more concisely maybe from them and get their opinion on it. Um, but I, 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 I agree. miss out on the chance of improving our water quality of the Herring River watershed. Um, if by what our actions could do could really, if our actions could really benefit that, I'd want to definitely explore that more too. Yep. I think it will be a net benefit, although it, it might be a small percentage watershed wide, but you know, you would, you would seize, you know, the, the introduction, the loading of nitrogen and phosphorus given to farming. Yeah. And so that there would be some net benefit. Would mm -hmm. it be significant? It's hard to say. Yeah. All right, um, Mr. Hall, we always appreciate your comments. Well, I appreciate you having me on here at 1030 at night on a Wednesday evening. Oh, I know. Um, I did, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, we stayed up with you. So I just got this report today. Thank you, Amy, for sending that along because uh, somebody gave me some notice that it was in draft form. So I just wanted to review it. I really haven't had a chance to digest it because there's a lot there. But I think it's a good stat. I think you put a lot of effort into it. I'm just, you know, I'm really confused about the whole situation growing up here in this area. You know, my grandfather owning that at one time, my father managing it, leasing it from the town uh, for Cranberry. So I have a, a hard stretch um, or a hard background as far as not giving up on Cranberries. And, you know, I'm doing all I can with the bog that we have to the north of this property uh, to keep that going. We got three acres planted. And, Want to do a couple more acres which i see in your plan here you also noticed what i recommended last time about maybe harvesting the vines and selling them as surplus or whatever we could do to do that to keep them going um and as far as the heron river watershed i mean that's another whole beast of um items that is just going to take a lot of work the heron river in my life growing up here it's a total devastation it's a mess it's invaded with invasive, invasive species uh, from Great Western Road North all the way to Hinkley's Pond. And it's just a mess. It's, it's uh, I don't know, there's not proper flow there. I'm not a scientist or anything, but I have a lot of common sense. And it's kind of like if you have a cold or a chest cold and you can't breathe well because of phlegm, that's kind of what I see that's going on with the Heron River from the railroad tracks, actually, the bike path north to Hinkley's Pond. So. You know, I, I don't know all about this attenuation stuff. That's what Bank Street Bogs were bought for. The Conservation Trust did that and put them out of out of production. And I don't know if that's really being a success or not. I don't know how we're going to evaluate that for the town of Howard. But um, we're losing things real quick here. And it comes down to about six or seven people making a dis, uh, decision for a major assets in the town of Howard. And, you know, I'm from the old school. And I'm a young guy from the old school. But I just... I'd like to uh, see things continue on. I don't think we need to get too too um, scientific about it. I mean, it's it's pretty black and white in some areas. And 
you talked about some of the access points down there and putting gates. That's a huge area down there and trying to police it. All the more reason if somebody was leasing or managing that bog, that person would be there, in, in, you know, because he's got an investment. So that person would want to make sure everything's safe down there. So those are some of the benefits of keeping the bog going because I think whoever would take that time and investment would clearly not want to lose out on that. Um, and that's the way it's been in the past. But the world's changing. I mean, I can't wait till 2020 is over, but um, I think you've done a great job, you know, working through this, but I don't want to see it go completely gone. One other question you mentioned on the upper bog, I think, I don't know what you had it labeled as a smaller bog to the north. In one of your options, you're talking about letting it go back to upland forest. Are you considering that bog now as upland or is that, how do we know that that's going to be an upland forest? What, what, what gave us that thought to be an upland forest? That's a good, good question. To me, that comes from the DR consultations that Amy had when they, they suggested there wasn't a lot of peat there. And that was one of the drier areas that would, that might trend in that direction. And, and that's a might, but that's, that's kind of what I gathered from that. And it is different in elevation. It's about probably four feet higher than that bog in the middle there. So you do have to pump the water up into it where the rest of the bog is all gravity fed. Right. So the vegetation that's coming back in that bog is indicative too, um, that it's pri primarily probably would be upland. But yeah, when I, um, DER and I kind of poked some holes in it a few years ago, went down with an auger at different locations all throughout the box to kind of see at what depth, one, what depth the peat was. So the original level before all the sanding and the um, cultivation, and then to see how deep the peat was. And pretty consistently the peat across all of the bogs was 18 to 24 inches down. But then in different locations, it was different thicknesses. So up in that northern area, it was only about six inches thick. But when you got, and then it hit sand again. But then when you got down to that, the lowest, you know, towards the outflow, you had three three feet plus of peat there. Right. So that would obviously, you know, hold more moisture and would revert back to more of a, a wetland, a wet meadow type area, you know. Right. So nothing scientific, scientific, just a little bit of poking around and observation. Okay. And then there was one other thing about comment. We all make it quick because we all want to go to bed, but um, <laughs> public access for picking the cranberries, just something to think about liability. The bog usually have a lot of poison ivy and that could be really challenging for folks. So I don't know how the town would accept that. Uh, picking your own risk. I don't know if we have that coverage, but again, if somebody was managing it, that person would have that responsibility and organize and have an area that's clean without any of that threat. So make it safe. Let me ask you a question. Do you get poison ivy? I don't. Yeah, yes. I, I think it, I think it as much. Yeah, that's Sun does your, family's been here, your family's been here too long to get poison yeah. ivy. <laughs> yeah. I currently have it. <laughs> well, anyhow, it's just, it's just those things we want to, you know, see it happen. We're, we're neighbors next door, and it's a beautiful piece of property, and the town's lucky to have that. So, uh, well, I, I want to say, I think, uh, speaking for all the commissioners, that uh, we really appreciate you showing up, being here for all these hearings, and really respect your opinion on all this. So, thank you very much for participating. Well, thanks for all your work, too. Thank you. Uh, we're not, well, we're not always on the same side of the story, but I think we're, we're moving in a direction to take care of the property. So um, I hope you'll participate next time. Sure, I'll be here. All right, well, have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. So if you want, I'll kind of I'll make those updates, um, a lot of them that Ernie had mentioned, and I'll try to continue to flesh this out a little bit for you. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Yeah, I, 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 I think, um, yeah, whatever, you know, it, it'd be nice, you know, the first, second meeting in September or October. That's kind of, I think, what we're looking at. And we want to hear from Jim and Mark for sure. Yep. And, uh, and have a publicized hearing 
it'd be, it'd be awesome to get together in person, but that, that may not happen. Would it be possible to, um, because most um, people are working remotely, I mean, I can talk to Mark and Jim too, but if we were to have the meeting, you know, say if we had it the second meeting of September, can we start our meeting a little bit earlier so we have and do this first um, and then get into hearings? I'm just thinking it would, it doesn't lead to a very productive discussion when you, I, I agree. We're all, at night. <laughs> yeah, we're all pretty toasty right now. So I, yeah. that's a great idea. And I, I think, you know, as long as we, we realize we're all leading towards a decision, you know, it's going to be a decision on this and, yeah. and you and Nick are working on the update of the management plan. And so, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll approve that and then we'll, we'll, or, or maybe first pick an option. But I think that's where we're moving towards. Yeah. And I think it's important during that meeting to fully vet each of the options, not just like go into it and say, okay, we're going to pick this one, but to really yeah. go through the options and say why you are or aren't in favor of that option, just so it's completely transparent. I, I agree. And and in your review, Amy, you, you will notice that option one and option four, I kind of have a little bias in there on, on how I feel the commission's feeling. Um, let me know if that's appropriate. Yeah, maybe we, I, I, I noticed that maybe we do take out, we change the language a little bit. Um, sure. I, and I, then, it was, but I like that you had the both extremes because that's important when you do alternative, uh, alternative analysis, essentially. Yeah. You have two extremes, so. And I tried not to just have my bias, but I, I tried to like suggest what the commission had been discussing the last two hearings. Yeah, you can definitely say what was been discussed. Yeah, what's been discussed. What's been discussed. Ugh, sorry, tired. I know. <laughs> All right, well, you, you tell us what you want to accomplish for the rest of the meeting, Amy. Um, there's a few uh, other things here. You let us know what we should do. Are you guys seeing the meetings, uh, the minutes in Dropbox? I'm having issues with my Dropbox tonight. No, I don't have them. Yeah, I haven't seen I don't I have tried them. to refresh. Sorry, the way it it might have been in last, last week or the last meetings and I think we at the end we said we were going to put them on the next meeting I just don't think I put them I just don't think I moved them in the right folder I'm sorry let me check in July 15th and see if they're there I don't see them there um so let's do them next time it's not a problem okay um, I'm not sure what today was a filing deadline and I got a few things in for the but for the next meeting, but we did put the two other docs off. So till September 2nd, which is helpful. Yep. All right, so I may be, sorry, I, I may be in Maine on vacation at the next meeting. I'm not sure when we're coming back. So maybe mm -hmm. passing the gavel to Ernie, possibly for the next August meeting. Sure. Just let me, uh, yeah, any, just let me know when you, when it gets closer and also anybody else who can't make it, please let me know. I know Summer's been really close for Mark. Um, we're doing it remote, Brad. You can call in on vacation. You know, I could, but <laughs> the cell coverage is very poor at this camp. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. But I, I got I'm shuffling teenager employment and schedules. And so I, I'm not quite sure yet if I'll be gone then. If I'll be gone close to then. No problem. No worries. Okay. Um, you don't need to take, we can even put the executive session off until um, the next meeting if you want to. It's really just an update. I gave you the documents privately in your Dropbox. Um, you don't have to take any action. You've already told me what in the last executive session that you want to pursue it. So um, if, if you want to go into executive session tonight, we can. Um, but again, it's not it's nothing time sensitive that you need to vote on. So if you want to do it at the next meeting, you can. How's the next meeting look, Amy, for the agenda? I'm not 100% because I do know a few things came in today. So, but I, okay. I, it I, might be I, fairly light. <laughs> I hate to go over four hours myself. And so it, I guess it's up to folks. If, if people really want an update, we can do that. Otherwise I don't mind putting it off. Um, how do people feel? Wrap things up? 
Uh, yeah. I think four hours is a long meeting. I think so. I, I, I hate to go beyond it. it. It's asking a lot from you guys as, as well as people who have participated. Okay. If it okay. was something that was time sensitive, I would tell you we had to, but we don't. Okay. How about your CPC piece, John? Do you oh, think we want to yeah. go over that today? I, I have two things, but oh, I, I promise it won't take much time. CPC, I, Nick, Nikki asked, asked me to put it off, but I told her I really wanted to have it tonight because the, I just want to tell you guys that there is a public hearing on the 20th, the day after our next meeting. Uh, and so I don't, we, I don't think we have time to have a discussion about whether there's anything that conservation wants to bring to that meeting, but you can think about it nonetheless, and it's not really a deadline. It's just a, it's a time for the public to come and make comments and inform CPC about things they think C CPC should be doing. Deadline for applications will be October 1 again. Yep. And the app this year's application is online now. So, um, And the other thing uh, which I had some emails with Amy and Brad about was just, and we discussed last time, was clearing the uh, herring run for Skinnequit Pond, which has gotten uh, significantly worse since we had this conversation three weeks ago. But um, I agree with Tyler to schedule that on the 25th, uh, which is not ideal because it's kind of far out, but I think it's important to get wrapped into their land, land management program and the alternative if we we're going to schedule at low tide was to for them to defer the muddy river project that they're doing on the 11th which i thought given the ambivalence of of Heinz, uh about the importance of this and lack of feedback from others we should just schedule it for the 25th so and i you know i will try to raise some volunteers here and i think we may have one or two through uh, HCT. Um, we'll probably have enough people. Yep. I'll come out, John, if I can. I'd, I'd like to keep it going. I was up in Braintree today removing frag, and uh, so uh -huh. hard work. Just, it just the roots are unbelievable. And uh, does the town have a sickle bar mower? I don't know. I don't know. I'm pretty Not sure we do that. What's that? I'm pretty sure we do. I'll ask. Okay, well, it's some other point we can talk about whether that would be worth the time, but if the town has one and we can get town labor to do it, it might be worth uh, doing a bigger job down there if we have the right machine. DPW has been very cooperative with me um, lately, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John. Pre appreciate your effort on this. That, that's yeah. that's a nice little side project you're working on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Any other updates or things we should talk about? Bad time. <laughs> I I must confess I've had the microwave going in the last 20 minutes. I'm eating my dinner. So. <laughs> Multiple times you overcooking. <laughs> yes, that's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready. All right, well, well, very good discussion tonight. Thank, thank you, everybody. I, I move that we adjourn. Second. I'll second that. Second all, all those in favor, say aye. Thank you. Aye. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Take care.